Hey everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. Did you know that eating low protein can actually cause you to overeat? Yeah, you're gonna learn about that and a lot more in this episode. In the second half of the show, we answer four live callers questions. Questions like, my traps aren't growing, what can I do? Or, what is the best way to naturally raise my testosterone? You'll want to find out about that. Finally, if you want short clips of the show, go to our other YouTube channel, Mind Pump Clips, and subscribe. And by the way, a lot of you already have, and thank you. So everybody else out there, go subscribe right now. All right, here comes the show. All right, look, studies have shown that eating more protein tends to help people be more satisfied. But does this mean eating a low-protein diet leads to overeating? A new study suggests, yes, that's the case. In other words, if you don't eat a high-protein diet, you are far more likely to overeat. Hmm. Yes. Seem, Doesn't that seem a bit, satisfied? A little bit, a bit obvious. It seems obvious, <laughs> but you know, you know uh, what? What? There's only three macros. So I know. If you, get, if you get rid of the most satiating one, <laughs> yeah, uh, chances yes. are. However, your you, options are slim. What I like about this, and what I like about scientific studies, is that they'll take something that seems obvious and then they'll test it just to make sure. Because sometimes you get results that aren't what you would expect. Right? There could be another variable or. Something else that's going on. Bum, 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 bum. I know. Water is wet. Water is wet. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but they did a study. They did another study, and uh, it was pretty well made. And it, in fact, does show what we would think uh, would be the result, which is if you eat a low-calorie diet, you're just more likely to overeat. So in other words, if, if, if weight loss is your goal or trying to avoid being overweight, and we've said this a million times, you want to eat a high-protein diet. Um, Low-protein just... It makes us overeat. Now, there's a lot of theories as to why this may be the case. And it's it, it's probably, this is the leading theory, which I tend to agree with. There's no way of knowing for sure. But I think because of the way we evolved, that our appetites were regulated by foods that tend to have more or less nutrients. And the, the most nutrient-dense foods on earth, the most nutrient-dense whole foods, I should say, on earth, are meat. Like if you ate a bunch of meat, the odds are you got all of the essential nutrients, proteins, fats, both essential, plus micronutrients and vitamins and minerals. And so I think when your body, it, with this, we evolved to where our bodies sense all this protein and then our appetite gets tamped down because our body's like, okay, we don't need to spend so much energy seeking food at the moment because you probably got everything you need versus... I'm eating a bunch of berries that I found that are growing wild or maybe some roots that I found that are wild. And because my body didn't sense the protein, it also knows, well, those foods have some valuable stuff in them, but they're probably not getting our essentials. So let's keep the appetite high so that the person is driven to search for more food. I think mm -hmm. there's some behavioral aspects to it too. Like, so we recently talked about how, um, you know, we'll just go on a diet where uh, I'm just going to focus on getting protein. That's my rule right now. Yeah. I'll just make sure I hit my protein take. One of the things that I notice when I do that, if I, if I, if I tell myself um, that I, there's no restrictions, like I, I can't not have something that I want. The only rule is I have to make sure I get protein first. Uh, it limits my options a lot of times. So in other words, like, let's say it's, you know, um, middle of the afternoon, I already had lunch. It's going to be probably two or three more hours till I get to a dinner and I'm starting to get hungry. I'm driving from point A to point B. It's like, if, if I, if I make that rule to myself that I have to get protein first, it's not as simple as just like pulling into a gas station and grabbing a bag of chips or right. nuts or something. So I, I feel like there's a behavioral aspect of that when you're targeting protein, because it's harder to find like protein rich meals in mm -hmm. comparison to carbs or saturated fat. Uh, I find that that also plays into a role of, of helping you stay within your calorie. Do you it, think it has? A lot I do. To do I think too? that's part of it, but you know, in the study, they don't, they're, they're not, they're, they're not, they're not accounting for that. Yeah. They're not working with people who are like making this rule. What they're finding is just people who eat more protein tend mm -hmm. to not overeat and people who eat less protein tend to overeat. Right. And they control for lots of different factors. Like you could have someone who eats less protein, but also has maybe an eating disorder. So just eats low anyway, low calories and all that stuff, but they're controlling for all this stuff. And so the first thing that you said about, like, I got to hit my, my protein targets. If you do that, and if you give yourself no limitations, like you're like, okay, um, you know, I can't, if I want ice cream, like, so if I want ice cream, I'll eat it. But I know I'm supposed to get 30 grams of protein first with this meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me eat my 30 grams of protein first. Then I'll eat my ice cream. 
you're probably going to eat less ice cream or not eat the ice cream at all. It just leads to, you know, uh, behaviors that lead to less chances for obesity and, and poor health. I don't now, even think it's... Oh, sorry, Justin. Oh, yeah. Did, did the study, like, account for it being animal sources, the protein versus, um, you know, plants, or was it just, like, any protein in general? A any protein in general. However, plant proteins are harder to come by as high protein foods as a percentage of total yeah, calories. Yeah, a lot of volume. Yeah. Yeah. So that. like, you know, what's a good high protein? Did you see that viral that viral tweet that someone did about broccoli comparing broccoli yeah. protein? Oh. <laughs> yeah, like you could assimilate all that. In well, one not even that. Like, you know how many pounds of broccoli you got oh, it's like just, a, a whole bush. That's, that's, like the, a that's the part that annoys the shit out of me because people would be like, well, you know, uh, legumes are high in protein. Yeah, for a plant. Food, but yeah, to get you thirty grams too, with gas, but, like yeah. thirty grams of protein, like you'd have to eat a ton of beans, and that would come with a lot of other stuff, right? <laughs> eat thirty grams of animal protein, and you, especially if you get a lean source, and it's like a small piece yeah. of like chicken breast or something like that. And if you want to make it fatty, you can, but that's the point. The point is, if you're seeking high protein plant foods, it's going to come along with a lot of stuff and a lot of volume and. A lot of that other stuff, where, where with animal sources, it's relatively easy. And it's, it's dense, is what it is. It's yeah. just very, very dense. Um, and then that, you know, that digestibility. Like, eat a two hundred, eat two hundred grams. Like, so I'm I'm two hundred pounds, right? So if I aim for two hundred grams of protein from plant sources, and I don't use protein powders, because you can get plant based protein powders, which makes it a lot easier. But let's say I don't. I'm like, I want to eat two hundred grams of plant protein. Oh my god, you know how much volume and all the 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 fiber. And other compounds in the in the vegetables that are going to make me just blow, and it's going to be just a challenge. Yeah. Two hundred grams of animal protein is hard to get, let alone plant protein. So, so that's that's really about it. But I mean, if you could do it, I guess you can. And I'm sure some people do better that way. But again, it's another study that shows that there's a strong connection between low protein and high and overeating, mm -hmm. which supports what we already know, which is protein satiating. It just makes you not want to eat more. Yo, here's the giveaway for today. Ready? RGB bundle. Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, Maps Aesthetic. All three for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment, we're going to notify you in the comment section. We're not going to notify you any other way. So we're going to notify you in the comment section that you won the RGB bundle. One more thing before we get going with this incredible podcast. Uh, we got a sale going on right now. Map Symmetry, 50% off. Map Strong. 50% off. If you want that 50% off discount, which will end, by the way, when the month is over, if you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below and get yourself set up with the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. How did your uh, morning go today? You seemed extra chipper oh, today. Oh, bro. You were all kind of like uh, <laughs> grinning and just in a good mood. I was like, what's going on? With this you know, guy? You Must have had a good weekend or what? What happened? What? Yeah, no, you know what happened today? What? It's the day I've been waiting for my whole marriage. <laughs> oh, wow. It was that good of a day. Oh, huh? so I good. felt I could see the glow, bro. What does that mean? Yeah. I could see it. <laughs> oh, it was so great. Was aura just, about I you. hope, was you know. Was it words she used today? I'm or? just, look, I'm speaking for, I think I'm speaking for a lot of husbands here. So I got a text this morning and Jessica's like, where's my hooded sweater and where's the baby's hoodie? And she said that and I was just like, oh, finally. And I'm like. <laughs> you can't find something? No, I said. I put them in the closet where they belong. And she's like, <laughs> finally, you did the right thing. She's like, oh my God. And I'm like, boom, you know, big letters. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to save this because I'm going to bring this up next time. <laughs> I put something away where it belongs if you couldn't find it. Because it's always the other way the around. The irony of that, yeah. right, too? She's like looking to all the places yes. the, <laughs> except for where it belongs. Exactly. Because it's usually right. the other way around. I'm always right. trying to find something. And she's like, well, it's where it belongs. It's in the, and I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's right. You know. Uh, so it finally <laughs> happened. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Document that. Yeah. Was she a good sport about it? Or oh, what? no, I wasn't. I mean, it's she thought it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, she say, screenshotted she it sport. and she yeah, sent yeah, it to yeah. her, her family <laughs> and all that stuff. No, yesterday it was, uh, not yesterday, Saturday. She went to uh, my cousin's uh, wedding shower. So I got one of my cousins getting married. Wonderful family. good, Very good people. And she's like, you know, it's two hours away. So she's like, do you mind if I don't take the baby? I mean, she's already, she's pregnant. I'm like, of course. I'm like, leave the baby with me. I'll hang out with the kids. And, you know, she's like, oh, are you sure? But I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. I'm capable. Don't worry about it, whatever. So she left and uh, I had a great time with the kids. And we used no electronics all day and, you know, I, I made sure to clean the house and put things away because I really wanted her to come back to feel like not stressed. Because I could tell she was worried 
that either A, she was going to come home and find a disaster. Right. Or she was going to come home and be like, oh, so you guys just watched movies all day. That's nice. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, uh-huh. no, I'm not going to do all that stuff. But it's pretty funny. It's funny, too, because I sent a text to uh, I'm in a group thread with like uh, my, a bunch of cousins and friends. And, and we're all dads, you know. And I'm like, man, you know, doing like the day to day mundane stuff with my kids. Like, I wish I knew this as a, when I was a younger dad with my older kids. That's how you really build a relationship with your kids. You know, mm-hmm. you think it's all like tedious crap. But by the end of the day, my younger, you know, my baby, he's, well, he's almost two. He was just, I just, he just was so close to me. He's hugging me and we're, you know, I could tell I feel more connected. Why? Because I fed him, I changed his diapers, I gave him a bath. I was hung out with him all day. And then of course I send that to my, my buddies and one of them gets all insecure about it. Well, I do a lot of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Oh, like, God. oh God, bro. Relax. <laughs> I wasn't I'm not pointing to, out. The, I wasn't insulting you. It was my, it was my yeah. own conclusion yeah. that I thought I'm not about. pointing out that you don't do shit at home, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You have to be careful when you say stuff like I that know. because people get offended. Uh, you it's know, weird. did you do which? Did you guys both do your interviews with Salemi yet, or just you I know? No, I haven't yet. So, did you guys get into Father Talk? That was like really. We cool. did. We did. We had a great conversation around that, and that was like one of his, uh, you know, his fears because ever a lot of his buddies have told him that he's about to become a dad. Yeah, yeah, right. He's about to become a dad, and that you know, oh, you know, I hear that you go through these phases where he'll be super connected to you and he won't be. And I said, Max is gonna is uh, over three years old now. And we've never gone through a phase of him not being absolutely connected to me. And I said, um, what I attribute that to, I could be wrong. There's a problem. I'm sure there's an exception to the rule. Some dad that did all the same stuff as I did. And he maybe went through that process. But for me, when I look at me and my, my, my two other best friends at the same time, we all went through this. Um, I was just involved in all the little stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the things that you just don't really think about that I think a lot- By the of, way, that's a testament to you because you are you were an older dad. Because I feel like you figure that out when you're older. When you're younger, you're just like, oh, I got to work, make money. That's well, it, I know? knew, mm-hmm. I that's why I wanted to wait till I got older was yeah. for that exact- was That's because, what I'm saying. That's because, good yeah, because I think- uh, um, you know, where I'm at in my life today, where I compared, like if you brought up 25, like- not only was I way more selfish at 25 years old, but I was also very much so busy trying to figure out my path. Yeah. And much of my time would be dedicated towards that. And I would have probably leaned, and I already do lean heavily on Katrina. She does do the bulk of the work, but I'm very much so involved in everything. I mean, and, and I and I and I make sure that she does too. Like she's really great about you know, if it's been a few nights where maybe uh, I haven't put him down or maybe I worked late and so I got less time with him, she'll make sure to like, hey, you want to do max tonight? You do the bath? Yeah. And like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that because I, I missed a day or whatever like that where I, or I got home late. So, and I just really think that being involved in those things of the putting down, the diaper changing, the feedings, the like, the more of that as a dad you're involved in, I think the more attached that he or she will be to you. And that at least that's my experience. Bro, right? you know, that lesson I learned the hard way with my older kids. It's when I got divorced, uh, I all of a sudden was now mom and dad, right? So I, it was so stressful. It was like a, a year period where I was so overwhelmed because now I got to do school lunches. I got to meet with the teachers. I got to get you ready in the morning, get your breakfast, make sure your clothes are clean, like do all the stuff. And I didn't do any of that before. And I was so overwhelmed. And I didn't put it on Jessica because Jessica and I were first getting together. And I'm like, I'm not about to like, oh, hey, welcome, you know, do all this <laughs> stuff now. <laughs> Take care of my kids. Yeah, so, and I mean, she did help, but I, I really took it on, right? And right. I was so overwhelmed, so stressed out. And then the craziest thing happened. Like, I started to know my kids, but I didn't know that I didn't know them before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm like, I'm talking to them. I'm like, I know them. I'm building a relationship. And it was a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift was before, I'm like, oh, this is all just a bunch of hard work. Now I realize, no, this is a, a blessing and opportunities. It's not the like, oh, we go on vacation and I play with you sometimes. It's the day-to-day yeah. stuff that we call bullshit. That's how you develop a relationship with your kids. Yeah, I'm always reminded about that. And I've been going through that a bit because I, you know, some of my efforts have been sort of split in terms of balance of like putting that into the football team and then coming home and then hanging out with them and being involved in their gymnastics and, you know, trying to keep tabs and updates of what's going on in their lives. And so I've, you know, I've, I've definitely tried to limit my time. So I do like two, maybe three times a week now where I go to practice. I don't go the full week. Cause I'm like, I need to like go to their practices and be involved in their stuff. 
And, uh, you know, I started bringing them more to the games. And so they're hanging out with me up in the box and we're like, you know, it's been a great, um, transition for me to, to, to bring in like, especially Ethan and stuff. Cause he's at that age where he's just like, I want to be with dad. I don't want to hang out. Uh, but, uh, with, with Everett, it's funny cause at night is when he wants to just be chatty and he just like tells me everything like before bed and he was just getting into like who he has like crushes on and stuff. So like, <laughs> I'm figuring out like who, like what his taste is, you know, and it's like interesting to see, uh, you know, what girls he's kind of into and whatnot. He showed me a picture of one and stuff. So now is he like, like your, does he have taste like you? Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't he's that very, he's very much into blondes. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you got good taste, buddy. Dude, my oldest, you know, God, he's going to listen to this and get annoyed. I'm not going to go too far. He has a girlfriend right now, doesn't he? No, no, no. Oh, he doesn't have a girlfriend right now. Okay. But, so I'm not going to get too much in it because you'll get mad, but uh, we're talking around this topic or whatever. And I'm noticing he likes like kind of the stuff I like. Like he's into like kind of smartish, maybe a little weird, you know, kind of girls or whatever. Yeah. And so Jessica's like, oh God, he's so your son. I'm like, I know, dude. It's just so funny, you know? This is like a type, huh? Yeah. yeah it's just so interesting. I know, dude. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I huh? I know. But he's, you know, he's, shit, he's going to be, he's going to be 18 next year, dude. He's going to be, oh, a, I mean, a man, I guess, you know? Yeah. I Legally. guess it's wild for me to watch because we've now been, you know, all the other for eight years almost, right? If, especially if you count the time leading up to before the podcast started, right? Because the podcast has been rolling seven, coming up on seven years right now, right, Doug? No, going on eight. Oh, we're going on eight. So mm-hmm. it's been like eight, nine years yeah. since we all really connected. And, um, you know, seeing D- Doug's daughter too, like how much she's grown. Like everybody, they were, right. I remember they were babies. Them, yeah, they were yeah. all so little. Dom was little. Uh, it's like, and now they're all like high school, getting ready to graduate high school. Like that's just crazy to to think that, you know? Yeah, I know. I'm having a lot of conversations with my oldest about um, uh, sex and drugs because he's mm-hmm. going to go off to college. Yeah. Now, are you, are, you, are you prompting that conversation or is he bringing it up a lot? You know, um, either. So it could be either or, right? So we'll have, and Jessica's really good about this. I still get weird about certain conversations when they talk about like sex or, especially when they ask her questions because Jessica's brutally honest. <laughs> and I'm always like, oh, fuck, did he just ask? Like, have you ever dropped acid? You know, or whatever. Like, I'm like, no, don't, uh, Jessica, just don't. <laughs> you just, they don't need to know. Yeah. Every, anyway, but it was, there was conversations and we're having these conversations. And, and what I'm telling my son is, I'm like, look, here's a deal. I said, you're going to be exposed to alcohol for sure. Definitely marijuana, maybe other substances too. I said, um, y- you know, you're going to drink and you're going to smoke cannabis first with me if that's what you're interested in because I want you to to know what it, what the limits are because I'm not afraid of him having the occasional drink or, you know, whatever. What I'm afraid of is him going too far. Yeah. Like I had, all of us had experiences of that because you, you test the limits when you're a kid. And you go too far, and that could be freaking dangerous. So are you guys, are you still on the same page as we were last time when we kind of had that little d- discussion about our kids? If if I had to choose either or, they got into drinking or into smoking, which would I would prefer? Mm. And I think everybody thought I would lean towards the smoking, and I was like, no, I'd rather, if my kids are going to do something like that earlier than I like, right? This yeah. is assuming that they- Boy, it's so hard, right? It's a hard it's pick. A tough one. It is know. a hard one, but if I if I Now, had what are the to, parameters it, that they that they use it too much or that they just occasionally no, have No, no, that's No, no, see, that's just it. You got to you got to roll the dice with the chances of that, right? It's just like if I if they got introduced to one or the other yeah. and oh. I and I had a I had a choice of which one, I would just I would prefer alcohol and most yeah. people thought, "Well, that's crazy." I, I think would, I'm with you on that. Most people didn't think that for me, but and and actually part of the reason why is because of how I feel like um how how much we've normalized cannabis and that it's uh, it, we a lot of the stuff that you see is is pro right all the health benefits of it and it's not as bad and oh it, even though you're smoking it it can even cancel out the cancers like it, it's yeah, net yeah. zero and like and so there's a, a not lot for of a developmental mind yeah, right there's so but there's but there's a lot of push though in that direction yeah. of like there's not as many social barriers I guess yeah. right and and so then I think and I I kind of watched this happen with my little brother because I shared this before I don't know if I shared it on on air but with you guys I know I have about. You know, I was right in the thick of the cannabis space, right, and, and the owning the clubs and being involved in that when my brother was your your son's age, mm-hmm. and I remember having this like conversation. It's like, and it was a weird conversation because 
I knew that I needed to, 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 to like tell him, be careful. And like, you know, it's, uh, and you know, but yet here I am in the middle of it. So I can't be like, you should no, say no to drugs. I can't right. be like that. Like yeah. he's going to be like, cause he's on. not going to listen to you. At right. All right. Of course. I, so the thing that I just kept trying to explain to him was just like, you know, just be careful because I know how much it tamps down your anxiety and I know how much it, it makes you feel good and relaxed. And I, I know all the positive things. I enjoy it too. Right. I'm not, I'm not denying any of that, but it also can creep into your life so easily that you go from using it every once in a while for anxiety to all of a sudden I'm doing it every day to then I have to be high all day long. I see what you're saying. And because you can function and do things at the same time, now you become this super stoner and you don't even realize how unproductive you are. In fact, I have many friends that think they're more productive on cannabis than they think they are off of it. And that's just because they don't know. That's a lie. Right. It is a lie. Yeah, and it's, right. and it's, and, 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 and of course, and there's someone listening right now who's probably in their head trying to defend themselves right now saying like, Oh, I am. You know, like, no, you're, no, you're not. not. Dude, you should, see, right what you, now, you should see what you look like. Hella sober. Okay. Yeah. That would be my challenge. Right. So, you know, for that reason, I would be more concerned about it where alcohol, like, it's very obvious when you get drunk, you know, the likelihood that you're- Yeah, you're not going to show up to work drunk. Yeah, you're, and you're you can show home. up to work after having an edible. That's right. Think, That's oh, right. You know saying. what I'm saying? And get away with it a lot easier. See, the way that I always think of it sneaky. is which one would I, which one am I more afraid of? Dangerous. Of use? Or, or, like, right. like if uh, being an alcoholic or a stoner, right. obviously alcoholic is worse. But I hear exactly what you're right. saying. What you're saying is with cannabis, the odds that someone's going to use it regularly- are higher probably because the, there's not as many social pressures. Yeah, yes. I think the consequences are more obvious with alcohol, right? Like it, totally. Yeah, it's just like very obvious. If I drank too much, this happens as a result. Or like, yeah. you know, it's like you can kind of uh, blend that line a little bit with, with marijuana where it's like, I don't think I'm abusing it, you know, like and you could just totally. It Bro, I had, I, so I was, I was talking to him and I've talked to him about this before. I said, you know, if you drink too much alcohol, um, it sucks and it could kill you and you get sick and all that stuff. I said, and I know they say that, that marijuana is, you can't overdose. I said, that's true. That doesn't mean you won't have a traumatic <laughs> event or feel like you're going to die. Right. And I tried to explain <laughs> yeah. to him. I said, yeah. overdosing on cannabis is one of the worst feelings oh. you could ever experience. You have some come to Jesus moments for you, sure. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you didn't die, but it don't mean you left like unscathed. But your ego died. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. or uh, everything else. Dude, yeah. You could get PTSD from too much. I know, I know you can. You should, you should, you should, you should keep that that clip right of the cop that calls him. Calls him. Oh, yeah. I like, that's such a good. I would totally use that clip. Like, listen, this is real, son. This like, cop yeah. threw himself into yeah. the bus. Yeah. Imagine in. how scared he has to be in order die. for him to call call the call cop, right. call nine one one. Yeah, uh, on himself. I'm a cop. Uh, yeah. So I, I have oh, I have a, a pretty funny story. So have you guys ever got? Well, okay, so whenever you find something really good, like say it's like a dog sitter, say it's like, you know, a babysitter or whatever, like a, a handyman or something, right? And like you, your your family or your friends kind of find out about it and you're like, wait a minute. You like, don't know if you want to share it? Yeah, because then they take him <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then it's like he's booked up and it's like you you just introduce them. So anyway, so Courtney and I are kind of talking about this because we have like a really good system now. Like we got somebody that can watch our house and our dogs if like we have to leave on a trip or something. And uh, like my parents found out about this and like they just like had a bad experience with one of theirs. Like, oh, can you send over, you know, uh, her contact to us and all this? And we're just like, dude, how do we like shuffle this? Like, because like I know for sure like they're going to want to take, cause they take a lot of random trips and we don't know. And they plan things way out ahead of time. And, yeah. and we're just like, dude, no, I don't want to give them keys to this car. You know? <laughs> like this is our person, you yeah. know? And so we're like kind of going through options and all this. And we're like, what would kind of deter them a little? Cause we, we, we are, I mean, the, the date they're, that he got, like, it's like, they're cool, but they're Satanists. Yeah, <laughs> that's basically what we're like. <laughs> we started texting. I'm like, yeah, you know, it may not be a good fit. Like, she smokes weed and, like, <laughs> <laughs> throwing them under the like bus. Like, her boyfriend comes over. Oh, like, God. most times we are okay with it, you know, but you might not be okay with it, you know, like, <laughs> trying to create all these scenarios where it's like, does it look like appealing and whatnot? <laughs> and so we're just like, <laughs> We're just, yeah, like Satanists. Like we're trying to come up with scenarios that will like scare them and deter them away. But I mean, finally, we were just kind of honest with it. We're like, oh, I think, you know, like we tried that same weekend, but she's not available. How many, did, did you, I, I wonder if our clients ever did that when we were training, when yeah, we trained people. I, I guarantee it. Sure. Yeah, I guarantee it. Sure. Of course Especially when you got real did busy. You, did have like, you, did so I busy. tell you about, did, uh, or did Cassie share with the app that she uses? 
So there's this, this is, there's a, a new app. It's really actually, she's done it now two or three times. And she says it's been an, an, an incredible experience every time she's done it. And you have a perfect area because you live in the Santa Cruz area, which is a popular travel place to go to the beach and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and you guys have a beautiful house. So these people, uh, they come watch your house and dog for free. It's basically in trade for being able to stay at your location. No way. Yes, and they're dog lovers. So these, so see it's, that it's, makes perfect. Sense. It's an app that has collected made people that love animals that are dog what lovers. What a disruptive who technology, all, right? Who Dang. also want to travel and go places, and then they look up and go like, "Oh my God, Santa Cruz!" And then and and there's like reviews. How do they on, like verify them? In there's rev just yeah. like review. There's reviews. Uh, okay. They're four star, five star. People leave comments. Oh my God, they were amazing. They cleaned my house and they, they my dog. They sent me updates of my dog playing with them every hour. Like, well, for them it's free. Of vacation course. home. Imagine whatever. getting to stay wow. at Justin's beautiful That's... house for free, and you want to go to Santa Bro, Cruz for vacation. And all I gotta do is feed your dog, walk your dog, and play That's with them a little bit. That's such a disrupting technology. Wow. You know what that? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. Cassie into that. loves it. So yeah. I'm, so I'm gonna give away a business idea because my son came up with this idea and it's along those lines okay so he says he says to me the it doesn't day, exist already no well i don't i don't know if it does right, i want to hear what you guys think it's kind of funny so we're sitting there washing dishes and he goes hey he goes have you heard of uh smash rooms i'm like what's a smash room <laughs> he goes you pay money and you go in these rooms you and you put it. on safety goggles and whatever and then oh, they, you just okay. break shit yeah oh, that was a different kind of smash. and he goes what if <laughs> No, not like Jersey Shore. <laughs> Those are a real thing. Yeah, so keep going. Yeah, you go in and you get sledgehammers and you break shit. Right, and right. it's like cathartic and you love it. Yeah, yeah. He goes, what if you connect those people with like construction demo jobs? So they show up to, to places <laughs> just to like to demo your kitchen. Right. But instead of paying them, you let them do it for free. They want to smash shit. Yeah. You get your shit smashed. I'm like, huh, I wonder. You, you know, it's, that's not yeah, a bad idea. I, you bad. know, if there's a business there, it would be... On the average job, how long is the demo process for most like jobs? And I, and you, I would actually that's think, the fun. That part is anyway. the funnest part. Yeah, well, I'm sure most carpenters guys are like, like yes, yeah, like, but you got to pay them still, right? You right. do. You got to still pay them to demo. I mean, shit. usually owners like that. That would be the only time they would actually do any of the work is like the demo <laughs> demo part. part yeah. yeah, they have it on these like do it yourself like home shows or like you know put gloves on. They're like ooh yeah. Ooh, smash. Smash. Like, yeah. It's like they, they don't know anything else other than smash. Yeah, but you know what, though? It was funny about that. So obviously my dad worked in, he did stonework, right? So we would go in all the time and demo bathrooms and kitchens or whatever. And at first it's fun, <laughs> okay? But that doesn't, it's real quick. You're just exhausted. You're breaking like old cement and tile or stonework. Yeah. And it's like, as a kid, you think, oh, I'm going to oh, slam the sledgehammer it, and it's going to break the whole favorite. floor. No, yeah. you slam the sledgehammer and then it, you break up a couple pieces and you're yeah. like, oh shit, I'm going to be here for well, there's four a, there's hours. A difference, <laughs> there's a difference between uh, getting this old beat up car and saying, go ahead, have yeah. at it, destroy it, versus someone saying, hey, I need you to beat this door until all the paint is off right yeah, here. Yeah, of course. You right. know what I'm saying? So yeah. then you have to like, after a while, you're like, okay, I'm over this yeah. one thing, right? So yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. Dude, uh, I had a buddy. Uh, my dad uh, used to obviously bring me to work, and then he brought one of my cousins once, and we were demoing this this room, and we yeah. had to break a wall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the wall, you know, obviously here, in Italy, walls are all concrete, but here, obviously, they're like sheetrock. And so my buddy's like, oh, watch this. He's like, I'm going to run through the wall. Oh, well, he hit a stud. <laughs> He hit Oops. a stud, bro. Yeah. He yeah. ran. Good. Oh, bro. It was hilarious. Oh, fell on the floor. No, it's it, it's the sound of breaking glass. And I, I guarantee you because the, all those like break rooms, smash yeah. rooms, whatever, like that's that's what everybody gets excited about. We, I was at a job where it was like I worked at a warehouse and like you'd have every now and then you'd have defective windows. And so we would have to throw them in these like huge dumpsters. And so we made like a sport of it. And so you'd like take it and you'd like throw it and you just put like, Oh, make wow. the best sound ever, dude. Oh, that's like so great. Break it with rocks. <laughs> yeah. I went with <laughs> one of my favorite. Uh, I went with my friend. Uh, so where he lived, the, he's got a huge property. And so basically he's he could shoot his own guns on his property. So he would go out and he'd get like old whatever, old computers, whatever. So it'd be fun. So we'd tip, sit back and we'd shoot it with different firearms to see how far the bullet would penetrate and what happened. Have you ever tried to demo or whatever break an old TV? 
Oh, like the old tube oh, the ones? Two, yeah. Like the ones that weighed 5,000 yeah, pounds? Yeah, and yeah. What did they make those things out of? Like bulletproof everything? <laughs> yeah. Bro, a, it was a, you know what went through? It's, a like 45. Shape, it's like the shape of the glass, right? It's like Bro, this. It just like spiders out. It doesn't even. Dude, like, like nothing went through. all the way through. We had yeah. to shoot that thing with a 45 to get the bullet to go all the way through. I couldn't believe how strong that was. <laughs> TVs oh, yeah. now, you breathe on them wrong and they break. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. And then you have to move that. One of my friends had one of those and it was like, you know, it was a big uh, piece of furniture, basically. That's what they right? are. Yeah. And it like had this huge tube that went like way back. And we were trying to lift it, and it was the heaviest, most awkward. And it only gave you like you know the fingertip amount to like grab underneath it. And we we're like going downstairs. I remember that was the most biggest pain in the ass thing I've ever had to move. Uh, how far are we away? You think from the, the our phones, which are already supercomputers, is just shooting up on with a 4K HD onto your wall? I think we're like this close, right? Yeah. We have to be close to that. Where you're, you have everyone has your streaming apps on your phone already, so you can watch your Netflix. Also, that it's just like all you yeah. need is this super powered lens that would cast and shoot maybe up. like a sheet or something. That well, you yeah, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. A sheet, a wall. You, have, you even have walls where you can, you paint with like a special paint and uh -huh. just paint the wall. Yeah. Then it, and it reflects off there really nice. Probably. Yeah. I'd say it's, it's, it's that has to be like, the, the corner. wouldn't you think that's the next evolution to the TVs? I yeah. mean, when the, when the flat screen came around, you saw that coming, right? You saw like yeah. the, them starting to change the way the TVs were and they were thin and light like that, that new technology. So what's the next big leap in that space? To me, that's the, yeah, that the thing would make that makes sense the versus sense. the hologram. I don't know if that's ever going to take off, but I've wanted it to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Little, yeah. I don't know if watching a movie with hologram forms. Just like eh, the little action weird. figures. A you know? scary movie with a real hologram. <laughs> That'd be terrifying. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, so. Speaking of that, are you guys watching? Are you guys watching Dahmer? Where you at? I, I only watched the first episode. Courtney's watching it, of course. Oh wow, it's, it's Doug, are you watching murder it? Murder driven. I'm not. Oh wow, interesting. I will. You know, it's like the most. So in the morning. I mean, here's like an obvious prediction, but I guarantee that will be the number one Halloween costume this year, for sure. Dahmer. Yes, for sure. That'll be. The, it's already. Old. It's like I think it's like the number one meme Dude, right now. A lot of people don't they're, realize they're, his 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 thing is like being used as a. I've like, seen all the one where he starts like dancing and getting all into it. Like I was like, what is this? A lot it, of people do not realize. Because Jessica had no idea. She thought, oh, Dahmer, he's the guy that killed people and ate them. I'm like, he did worse than that. Like, I'm trying to explain to her. Like, he was in a necrophilia. He would cut yeah. off body parts Ugh. and use them and do things and just weird... I Shit, Easy. you know our good friend. You know our good friend Matt. I saw Max. Max was actually the reason why I finally turned it on because I was like, oh, I'll yeah, get he was raving to it. about it. Huh? He said one of the best shows he's ever seen in his life. Yeah, See, he put up there with like top ten ever greatest. I, I told Courtney that too, you know, because she's watching. And she's like, kind of screens things for me, and he's yeah. like, you know, I'm like, am I missing out? Like, <laughs> you know? And she's like, you wouldn't like it. Like you wouldn't like it. It's just like. Just a whole lot of, um, well, I mean, obviously, like every episode is basically about him kind of like struggling with the fact that like he's into dudes, yeah, and, like you know, trying to reconcile whatever. But I, either than that, like it's just all murder and, and gay. It's you know, okay, I if someone were to pitch it to me, I would probably say, yeah, it's not really my thing, or I'm whatever, I'll get around to it. I wouldn't be that excited. And what I found, and this is a, this is I think to like Max's point, the the acting, the music, the cinematography, like it's just very well done. Mm, it's, it's accurate. Yeah, it's very yeah, it's very accurate. It, it pulls you in, like even something like that, which is not my vibe. To I mean, you guys know me; I don't even like scary movies, right? So like this, you know, creepy, this, and it doesn't get scary. Yeah, are you losing oh, sleep? What's going on? <laughs> I did so. I th first time ever. This has never happened when I watch a, a show before where I was getting nightmares every time that we watched it. And I told Katrina, you get, I, in your nightmare, were you getting lured into some, some dude's house? <laughs> yeah, bro, it was weird stuff. It was, they were way too weird. It was weird, creepy dreams. Like, so I told her, I'm like, we can't, I can't watch that. That can be the last thing I watch before I go to bed. But it has, it keeps pulling me in where I'm like, I'm fascinated by it. And, it, and they did a really good job. So you want to know what sucks about all this is, uh, so I was having a conversation with Vicky and she's just, we were, she was like, what makes like, like, what's the deal with serial, serial killers? Like, why do they, cause obviously Dahmer was crazy, did terrible things, all that stuff. Yeah. She's like, what makes serial killers do that? And so we have decent data on this and part of it is severe trauma as a child in combination with the like the right genetic mix, either from genetics or epigenetics due to environmental factors like maybe mom did drugs when she was pregnant or mm. something like that, right? And, but we don't quite know. But here's what we do know. And this is a fact, and this is the thing that's, that's crazy. We know for a fact that when serial killers or mass shooters or anybody who's like super crazy, when we glorify them and create the, and turn them into these celebrities, 
You get more of yeah, them. More, there's mimics. So that you was get my, more of them. That's yeah, my fear about it being like right. the number one show in the country right now. Already happening. Totally. Did you guys? Okay, I'm gonna pull this up. You know, so um, Geo just now. Let me see. Did he send it to me? He didn't send it to me. Did he send it to you? It's in the group chat. Let me look it up because I, I. It's not. I don't think it's pulling up. Why did you ask him to phone? send you something? Yeah, or I don't. Heard? I don't. Oh, is that Stockton? Yeah. Okay. There's a serial killer in Stockton right now. That they're looking oh, for. Oh, good. Great. Right now. Who's already killed five people or something like that? Like just recently killed yeah, five right people? right now. I'm going to Sacramento this yeah, weekend. Right now. Cool. Yeah. Stockton's wow. far from Sacramento. Is it? Okay. I think so. I uh, but I think it's within the radius of where serial killers <laughs> tend. No, so so here's, and this is a fact. It's we know this. To me. People who are on the border, okay, who are crazy and on the border, when they see a glorified mass shooter, oh, kid shoots up a school. Here's their picture. Here's their name. This guy Dahmer. There's a whole series about him. People are gonna dress up all the, like him for Halloween. Everybody's he'll be, talking he'll about be the him. number one costume, guaranteed. You're going to create more of them. You know, there's countries that make it illegal to broadcast a serial killer or mass shooter's name. You know what's funny about yeah. that, Sal? That you bring that up. That I remember when I found this out years ago, and I was fascinated by this. And it's we do that with bank robbing. Yeah. Why wouldn't we do it? Right. How weird? How weird are we? We don't glorify. We don't, we're worried that. about our money. We're worried about someone stealing our money. Our accounts. What's the statistics on that? Because the, the, so 50%. many percent bank robbers get unreported. They're like, yeah, they're like 50, 50. and they don't glorify them on purpose because yes. they don't want people to go rob banks. They don't want people they to know, know that. that they it's don't possible. Want, they do not want them to know that it's actually pretty. I mean, it's 50 percent chance you get away with it. Yeah, that's a, those are pretty good. Those are pretty good chances wow. of good going and robbing. Conspiracy a theorist in me is like, why are they like? Why are they allowing this? I don't know, but it's it's to me. Mm. It's literally, this is what happens. Okay, serial killers haven't been a thing for decades. 60s, yeah. 70s, 80s, early 90s, it was like serial killer time because they happened. They got glorified. By the way, they would save news articles up with their name in them. Some of them would write letters to the police well, to try to get them to chase them. Zodiac well, killer. Well, part of the formula is narcissism, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden now, Dahmer's- Lack of empathy. Yeah, Dahmer's like a celebrity. So you got some kid or some psycho- Who's on the borderline, and he's like, "I'm going to go out with a bang." You know what I'm saying? So yeah. this is just—it's that's what makes me sad about this a little bit. Well, it's interesting to me. A lot of the ser serial killers, like back in the day, like how they're now attributing some of those of you know the MK Ultra experiments, like it, it's yeah. some of it tying back to that what? initially. Yeah, oh, God. there's there's quite a few of them that they can like attribute, and they think that like uh, Manson even was one of those. Uh, that Manson, started out Manson used Ultra. psychedelics as part of how he brainwashed. He had middle class kids, right? With, Young teenage boys, right? Isn't that what he did? No, he got a group of people. I, I, some of them are uh, girls. And uh, I thought he was middle class boys that were like teenagers. No, I thought that's what it was. Um, I, and don't, I thought he got them all high on psychedelics and convinced them to go do his dirty work. No, well, yeah, but I, there was I think there was a girl or two. Oh, I don't know that. Too. And he, he, I thought he was like very specific. Like I thought it was like teenage no, boys that come from like middle class. No, homes. it was like well to do normal kids. Uh -oh. And through he would like brainwash them and use psychedelics and stuff like that and got them to do some of the most heinous shit ever. It's yeah. really crazy. Oh. Yeah, so publicizing this stuff. Anyway, the, the question Vicky asked me, she goes, how come they're always men? Why are serial killers always men? And uh, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, the theory around that is that nature- Supposedly, maybe we just never find the women. Mm, they're smarter. Maybe. Uh, no, no. First off, female serial killers exist, but they're they rare. Exist. Um, it's because- That's my whole monster movie, right? It yeah. was about that. It's because nature rolls the dice with men more often. We're expendable. So when you look at a chart, if you looked at a chart of insanity on one side, violence and insanity over here, and then like extreme productivity and innovation on the other, so two extremes, yeah. a higher percentage of men make up the ends and a lower percentage of make up the middle where you see more women in the middle. And that's because the theory is, evolutionarily speaking, men can, the, the nature could roll the dice with men because you need women. You don't need a ton of men. One, you know, one man can get so many women pregnant. One woman can only get pregnant once a year, once every nine months or so. So it's like they roll the dice. So we're more likely to have that combination of, well, I, of I mean, genes that makes us crazy. I mean, that's a, that's a, a pretty deep way to look at it. I mean, a simpler way to look at it is that the likelihood that you would have a, a woman, the woman would have to be like a, a, in the top 1% strength wise to make sure she could handle all of her people she's trying to kill, where the average man strength wise 
could hold down. Oh, no. No, so there's serial killers that kill people with poison. And I know, smart. but there's other, of course there's other ways to do it, but I mean, uh, at least from the way they're depicted, there's always a, there's almost always one with a struggle physically where in order to... Oh, no. I, it, you believe me, if there's, there's a small guy, there's been like guys that are not that big that kill... I mean, my, I, really, it's, it's... Well, that's the main theory. The main theory is that... Because that, if you look at like um, insanity, like uh, insanity is much higher in men, but so mm -hmm. is high productivity, single-minded uh, innovation type stuff. Which, by the way, that is also correlated with a little bit of craziness. You ever meet like a super creative, super innovative person? They're always a little weird. Yeah. So it's just the roll of the dice. And so you're more likely to get you know, both ends of the spectrum. That's the theory, at least. And it sounds kind of yeah, like Yeah, watching the show, it, it looks like it, he's like the perfect storm. Of all the things you need, yeah, like a little, like he has, a, like he genetically, it seems like he's a little predisposed to some of that stuff, or like he it runs in the family a little bit. He has major trauma that has happened. Like he also went through puberty at the time that a lot of this stuff was going on, so he's connected some of that. Like, so he seems like he was like the perfect storm for somebody who would turn into. So this the monster. last one was uh, Ted Bundy, right? They did a series on that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it seems like it's just like a, a cycle, and then they're gonna go to the next serial killer to wasn't the, since it goes so well right? wasn't the killer in um uh what's that science of the lambs he was based off Dahmer, right i believe so oh he was or, or parts of him yeah. right because I he mean, ate remember he ate his victims well, the yeah. cannibalism part yeah i mean i've seen silence of the lambs and i've seen Dahmer. Right? they don't seem anything alike yeah, oh, i'm not I thought sure maybe he yeah. inspired that Ma a little i bit. mean maybe there's the cannibalism part of it or something like that but uh even that they're i mean they're the way they're depicting it in the show is different i don't mean I don't want which to by the way like still one of the more disturbing movies i've ever seen when i was a kid you, what <laughs> remember the first time you watched Science yeah of the lambs? yeah i mean that's just a, the Dahmer thing it will disturb you on because a, it's real whole yeah on a whole nother level like it's it's and they did a good job, man. I mean, that, that they did that. It's not a show I thought I would watch, and it's it found. I mean, look at yeah. it. it's, it's like number one right now. I think. Look it up, Doug. What it's doing? I think it's breaking records right now. It is. Yeah, it's doing all. I saw an article on it. You, did you? Yeah. All yeah. right. So let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I was listening to a conversation um, about. So I've, I've kind of been keeping track, like you, Adam, keeping track of like what some of the experts are saying. People I trust, at least, about the economy and markets and what's happening. And um, I mean, all signs, I don't think anybody are argue this now, but all signs are pointing to big recession kind of looming. And um, I heard a great conversation. It was Chamath on All In Podcast, which I love his input. Dude's super smart. And he said, yeah, one of the first things that companies do when, because right now Apple is, do, is, I think, either freezing, hiring, or, or laying people off. Mm. I think Google said something like, if you can't come to the office, uh, then you can't work for us, which automatically got rid of a bunch of people. Or no, it was, it was Meta. Tesla Meta said did that. that first, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and that's kind of like a easy way of laying people off is giving them an ultimatum type of deal. You know, this is the first time in history since Facebook has been around, they will not grow uh, yeah. employees. Year I mean, year. these are the big monster companies, uh -huh. Google, Apple, uh, Meta. Like oh. these are like, and they're like, if they aren't doing, if they're right. starting not hiring. So anyway, he said one of the first things companies do is they cut advertising and marketing. And I was thinking about that. And this is why I, I told you this morning, Adam. So I'd love your, your input on this. It made me think like, because companies still need to market no matter what. If you're a company, you have to market, okay? But they're going to cut marketing. So my thought was what they're probably going to do is try to be much more s strategic with marketing. And I feel like this could be a, a potential opportunity for content producers because if you're like a social media, you know, quote unquote influencer or you have a podcast or whatever, you may not have the reach by yourself like you will with broad, you know, broad-based advertising, but your conversions always so much higher because of your influence over your audience. So I feel like so they'll lean heavy on the conversion side of it over like the brand plays. Yeah. So instead they may be like, we're going to cut marketing, but we're going to be much more strategic. He was about very optimistic in the podcasting space and for us and it, I was a little more pessimistic about it. So I I don't disagree with you, although I don't I don't think it's going to be a good thing for us. And the and the reason the reason why is because one of the harder things about advertising on things like radio, television, podcasting is to be able to to measure the ROI. You have to kind of estimate. And there's a lot of things out there that say like Edison did a report years ago about uh, the behaviors around podcast consumers. 
that nearly half of them don't even use the URL that we drive through. So you through. can't even track. Right. So you can't even track for sure. So I use that a lot of times when negotiating contracts with partners. I just tell them straight up, like, hey, listen, uh, every everybody who you know wants to do advertising, they're looking for well, you know, two, two and a half times uh, ROI. And it's like, okay, well, if you're looking for two and a half times ROI and I'm telling you that 50% of the people don't even use the URL, like you're really getting like four or five X. That's unrealistic. So I've had that conversation enough times to with partners that they go, oh, okay, I get it. I understand. So basically it's like, as long as we break even, then I'm okay. I think that because there is that gray area in radio, television and podcasting, it's going to make those areas work because I still have to deal with this. Even people that I've had that conversation with, they're still like, oh, we're, we're barely, we're barely breaking even, you know, like you think we could do this or you think we do that, or maybe we'll slow down advertising. So I'm always having to have that conversation. I think you're going to, they're going to see more and more of that. And the reason why is because you can go to Google, you can go to Facebook, you can do ads where it's very cut and dry. If you, if you have a good campaign set up on Facebook or say Google ads, you can literally get it in, especially big companies that are sophisticated like this that have the, have good uh, CRMs can go, okay, um, I'm going to put $10,000 into our advertising on Google or Facebook, and it will return me 12500 It's a direct- because the know, analytics are so specific. Yeah, very, very specific. It's there's no there is no gray area. Now, there's no like I have my my person may or may not use. Now, our do you think as as companies become more educated because there's still value in advertising with a content producer over something like Google or Facebook? So I so that that part I totally agree. So with as you. they become more educated, and as the market and the economy goes down. And they're looking at their mar they're looking like, hey, we still need to market. We just don't want to spend as much. I as just we did don't before. think we're there yet. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. Do you think it's going to accelerate that because of the pain that they're going to feel? Because because they're going to feel pain because they're going to be like, we need to market. And yes, we're getting this return from Google, but it's only giving us so much. That's a possibility, right? That that this may be this next year to two years when we go through this time. Um, it it may be a rude awakening for a lot of companies, or they might find out the hard way, right? They might, yeah. let's say, uh, one of our partners that's been with us for a long time and has been okay with the you know ROI up mm -hmm. until now, but now they have to cut costs, so they're like, oh, you know, sorry, love you, mind pump guys, but we just can't afford to keep doing this. They cut us, and then and, they feel a, it. and then six months to a year later. They've, they've been on this decline and they cannot figure out why their money's not there. And you're right. So they might, and they might find out the hard way, like, oh, wow, maybe we were getting more revenue from yeah. them than we thought because we can't technically track it to the, to that level. Because the future is democratized media, not old media. That's and I agree future. with that also, right? So I agree that the future is content creators. Like if you have a company in the future, you're going to have to be connected to creating content. Well, otherwise, you're not going to convert. Well, I just think the opposite will happen. It won't be that. It'll be if you start a new company, you will e immediately look to attach yourself to con uh, uh, to or do it yourself, which is unlikely. Yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah, because that's we see companies try and do that. Because I mean, look yeah. at look at here's your evidence. You have people like Kim Kardashian entering into a market like makeup, yeah. and crushing. The old companies have been around forever, just mm -hmm. murdering them. Yeah, Mr. B starts a chocolate bar, starts a burger joint, all of a and just he's, murders. He's, McDonald's he's the number one everything. chocolate bar, and number one burger joint in like. So over, I feel overnight. like I feel like what's gonna happen, what may happen, is it, and this is what happens. Uh, what's his name said this on that show, and I love it when he says he says wealth is created in downturn economies, and then it's realized in the upturn. In other words. When shit goes down, that's when the the, the like the these, these innovative new ways of doing business are created, just because the pressure. Mm -hmm. And then when the upturn comes, that's when they collect. Yeah, that makes sense. That's when they collect. So this may push, in my opinion, this is how I'm, I'm speculating here. It may push what's falling. You know what I mean? It may 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 make it happen faster. Where these companies are like, yeah, uh, we're, we're not going to market the old way because that we don't got the money. We need to be like specific. I mean, with, we're on the same page with that. I agree with that. We just don't but know if it's. the I'm right not time. as optimistic that I think that like it's not going to be that quick of a turn. It's like unfortunately, uh, humans, we may have to feel a bunch yes, of pain. Yes, humans first. tend to have to feel a lot of pain before they wake up and go like, oh shit, this is the yeah. way. Or and then also, uh, you're also assuming that they uh, they have the. The, the back end to really be uh, uh, you know sophisticated enough to know like oh this this is what's going on I, I mean I think there's going to be a lot of people that feel pain and don't realize it and are like trying to guess well so so which brings us to another part of this which is and they, this was another thing that they said that startups this is a good opportunity for startups because uh, when everything was booming and you were a startup and you wanted to hire talent they came and demanded high salaries, all these mm -hmm. perks, because Google's hiring, Meta's hiring, Apple's hiring, all these other companies. But now, 
nobody's hiring. So now you may be able to scoop up talent. And so we may see small companies pop up and small companies love podcasts. And so that was marketing. the point Finally, I was going to bring up. Designers would be humbled. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Finally. Totally. They're big ass heads. That was the point I was going to make up when you, sh you sent over that, that graph that like showed how, how bad the, the, the money investment. Yeah. The investments. Cause I was going to, I was say, Hey, I have, I have opinions on that. I think there's some positives to yeah. that is that you're there. You're going to be able to get better talent right now. You're not going to see these crazy inflated numbers. And if you're, let's say, one of the startups that we invested in the last two, three years, because at first it's kind of like, oh, great. What are the likelihood these guys are going to make it through this? Well, the truth is, if they do weather this storm and they do make it through the next you know, year to two years of this, this downturn that we're going to have, then they're going to be a very resilient company. And then when they, when, the, when they catch the wave on the way back up, they're going to be ahead of a lot of people. Yeah. So there's, there are some, I think, some positive sides to you know, these startups or, you know, in, you know, the angel mm -hmm. investing we've done. I think that if, if you make it through now, it shows that you have a pretty robust, you know, or run a tight ship, you know, as far yeah. as your business. And so it could be positive. You know, speaking of, mm -hmm. uh, of partners and stuff. So I was thinking about public goods, this company we work with uh, for people who don't know who they deliver home goods and products to your door. Um, very environmentally conscious, so the packaging is is good, you know, low waste, um, and, and they don't they don't put any chemicals known to be, you know, hormone disruptors or whatever in their product. So it's a really conscious company. But I thought about them because yeah. one of the things that annoys the crap out of me is I hate being lectured to by celebrities on shit that you know that they're massive hypocrites on. Yeah. Like Leonardo DiCaprio, oh, the environment and the climate, and whatever. He's got yachts and private jet. The guy's spewing more pollution than the next 5,000 people combined. And there he is, yeah, you know. It's always the sky is falling information without like any actionables behind it's it. It's just annoying to me. And then I'm thinking like, you know, the truth is if we really want to make an impact, the best thing you could do is not grand gestures. It's just like fitness, right? What's the best thing you could do for your health? Uh, it's not the grand gesture. It doesn't last. What you do are the small things that, that you can inject into your life. So what you can do is, look, you already use soap. You already use shampoo. You already use all these household products. You have dog food. Yeah. You have all these, uh, all switch to a company. You're not going to spend more money. If anything, you'll save money, but you're going to get products that are more environmentally friendly. And if everybody did something like that, which isn't a big ask, right? It's not a big change. I'm not telling you to get rid of your car, ride a horse or some, some crazy whatever, or not drive anymore. All I'm saying is you already use these products. You switch to a company like public goods where you're probably going to save money anyway. That's the best way, in my opinion. And these celebrities making these big, like, oh, you, you buy guys, the yes. bottles and you just buy the refillable packages that, like, biodegradable. Biodegradable. Yep. It's less waste, you know, like, it's an actionable thing you can do. Uh, I mean, between that and I'm always like, uh, plant trees. And, like, everybody thinks that's ridiculous, but you can look at the numbers, statistics of what that does in terms of, like, lowering the, uh, the emissions and carbon in, in the atmosphere. It's, it's pretty substantial. Yeah. And they plant trees for every, I forgot how many dollars. Exactly. They, they actually, yeah. So they, they, they're all backed behind that. Well, yeah. they're, they're a perfect example of what you were just explaining about what's happening with, um, you know, companies and content. I mean, a company like Windex is, is going to eventually die. Like, yeah. it's like, I mean, it, that brand is so strong because we know it just because it's been popular and commercial since we are kids and stuff like that. But when you can go and shop at a company like this, where you know they're the, what they're doing, and you can get behind it, and you can get it in the hands of people like us that have a network that you're influencing, mm -hmm. and obviously we're not the only company that Public Goods works with. There's a bunch of other small companies that they yeah. work with, and so now you could literally take a company that would have no chance at competing with you know all these house products that we all have seen in our house forever but this is to the point of what the guys on all in were saying like we're only like a decade away from like a lot of those big monopolies completely dying and the consumer is getting wiser about how they make their purchases well they're like, the people that are loyal to those brands that generation yeah, that listens die. to that listens <laughs> to radio and yeah. watches broadcast television like they're the younger the generation out. doesn't do that they just don't my kids don't understand old brands they know brands that they that they hear from their YouTube, you know, content creators or mm -hmm. Instagram or podcasts. So it's a hundred percent right. And the and the thing is, conveying a message that requires people to change their habits, you're more effective when you have an audience that really values what you have to say versus you know broadcast TV. Like it's like that's like you know nuking 
something and, and hoping that you hit the right people or whatever. It's like, this is like precision, you know? Yeah. And I just compared nukes to <laughs> nukes. <laughs> advertising. Sometimes my analogies don't hit. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of partners again, you know, um, so I was at home last night watching TV and uh, I had a real rough night of sleep the night before. So I'm looking for my Felix Ray blue, blo blue blockers. Couldn't find them. So I found this old pair. This is before we ever worked with Felix Gray of, of these other blue light blocking glasses, but they're the orange ones. And I put them on and I'm watching TV and I'm like, this is, you know, uh, that's got TV with orange lenses is not a good combo. That's got to be the biggest barrier between people wearing blue, uh, you know, not wearing blue light blocking glasses. They they're on their electronics. They don't want everything to be orange. Yeah. That's got to be the biggest uh, hurdle. So, yeah. with, you know, the Felix Ray ones are clear for people who don't know. They still block blue light, but you could see everything looks the same. When did we bring up on their, their last time we had their commercial? Did we talk about, you know, that they moved into contact lenses? Did we talk about that? Blue oh, light blocking we didn't contacts? Know oh, yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk about it. We no, didn't. We, we didn't talk about it, huh? No. Yeah, you guys know that they have blue light blocking. They just contacts. are they, they blue light blocking, it, but or are they just contacts? Uh, look, look them up. Look up. Felix Gray gets into contact lenses. I would assume. That I would assume. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would, would be their angle. Would be <laughs> having blue light. Yeah. Why would you do? Why would blocking. you do contact lenses that are not blue light blocking? Right? Wouldn't that be kind of counterproductive for the company? That's wild. That? That'd be kind of cool. No, it's super cool. Yeah. yeah Especially no, if you work on a computer all day. No, yeah. They're quietly making moves, dude. They really are. I mean, they, they since the very I mean, since the very beginning, I've, I've always been interested in the in the company and who they've partnered up with. They went the slow route. I know they're on the higher end and stuff like that, so it's it's a little bit slower to adopt because you know right now the message around blue light blocking, everybody is jumping on the bandwagon, but then what everybody does goes right to Amazon and looks up like the cheapest, cheapest pair yeah. of yeah. blue light locking. And they, they, they're not that company. Again, you know, to the point when I made on the forum, the other day it's like you know when we started this business the, they're not all the same by the way they're not all created the same there's, no they're not yeah. absolutely not just like everything isn't it's just like the viore athleisure wear that we wear is not created the same it's just i, I mean one of the things that we all agreed on which i love that we were all on the same page is that if we are going to do this is before sponsors and partnership if we're going to do that we're going to go after the best not the cheapest not the fastest the most convenient the it's quality. what we think is the best in a space or an area that we're interested in and felix great to me was 100 percent that when when we were first What's looking to say for there so I'm not sure if they're actually blue light blocking lenses, but they're designed to reduce eye strain. Okay. So if you're working on the computer a lot. It's got to block some blue light then. Uh, What's it yeah. saying? It says superior structure meets long lasting moisture. Is that what it says? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, they're more comfortable fit. Uh, they're, they're with the breathability and so on with the lens. Uh, they have this optical center point, which eases eye strain. Okay. So it's not uh, blue light. Water rich lens material. So basically a better hydration oh, for interesting. the eye. Uh, so it's really designed for people who are in front of the screen a lot mm. to, you know, have less eye strain. Huh. I wonder if he just saw an opportunity there that in the space that somebody of wasn't course. wasn't providing a better a better contact lens. Of course. Huh. That's really interesting. Do, who, do, you, do you use con who's contacts in here? Does somebody use contacts in here? I use contacts at night. I use a lens that actually reforms my eye at night and then the, in the morning I take them out and my vision is good. What? Yeah. What? You Called, really it's called orthokeratology. I've been doing it for like 15 years. Wow. Mm. That's really cool. He really has brown eyes too. Those are fake blue eyes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. You remember it's, when that was a thing? When it was thing like girls would put different colors? <laughs> yeah. Katrina, purple. Katrina did, I think, purple. I did think she, she really? Yeah, yeah, I think she did purple. Purple? Or, with that. or no, I, I think she told me like true. blue is what she did. Yeah. Yeah, you remember when that was popular for I girls? Do. Yeah, there was a there was a point when like right when the colored eye it's lens real thinking, deceptive, yeah, like uh, you, you, yeah, you think like they're like bright green eyes, you're like whoa, it's like striking, and yeah, it's just the like super exotic. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, it's all part of the everything. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I get it, right? They're already wearing like bright lipstick, or whatever. yeah, dude, you have painted your face. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Dang, you got me again. <laughs> you know, wow. I wonder what in the future if we're gonna have like uh, CGI faces, you know what I mean, or something's gonna broadcast. Oh, did you see that article? <laughs> Somebody sent that over to me. Oh, I got to find that maybe doug could look it up for us remember what i said about uh, the future of acting was gonna happen you oh, yeah. oh bruce yeah. willis bruce yeah. willis yeah. did you guys we, see that? He sold, that he sold his likeness for future cg yeah. we knew that was gonna happen yes yeah that's i mean it's, how wild is that gonna be dude? how much did he make I don't know. Isn't that cool? That's, he, that's the start. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a Tom Cruise and the, every other A-list actor. Dude, why? I mean, writing contracts. For I, right I feel like I would, I would take the less money, have my likeness, and use my CGI, and I don't have to do no acting. Like that's awesome. I mean, you're seeing it almost everywhere now. Like they're bringing back old characters in movies and in TV shows. It's it's going to be weird. Okay, think about. Okay, try and figure this part out. Okay, think about the market. What that will do. How much that will disrupt that? Because now you could you could literally do ten movies in a year. 
So now someone like Bruce Willis would be willing to maybe give out his CGI likeness to 10 different potential movies because he can do 10 in a year where realistically what an actor can maybe do one or two a year. Now, how far away are we from actors not being people anyway? And it's all create, they're going to like movie studios are going to create their own actors. That's what I'm saying. No, not have to buy. Oh, well, there's no, see, I don't think that's going to happen because you don't think that'll ever happen. No, we still as humans, I mean, you've talked about this before, like how, uh, like why we're into like the the king and queen and and royalty in the United States. It's celebrities. Yeah. But think about it this way. Imagine if, okay, CGI is so good that it looks real. So what you're watching on TV, you can't tell it's not an actor. You think that's a real person. That's fair. And a movie studio creates a CGI character for a movie and it's so realistic and so good that you love that character or that actor, or that CGI, and now that same person can be put in different movies by the movie yeah. studio. Yeah, I don't have th- you I don't have see you that. seen those like AI generated scripts? And, yeah, you know, like paintings. Yeah, they were all terrible. And, oh so. my god, they're so awful, but they're like hilarious at the same time because it's like dude, the clunky. Paint- but like, imagine once they start figuring I, it out, like what that. I think the do. more likely scenario is that. It's going to be a extremely competitive market, and I mean, now you're going to see YouTube stars sell their likeness. You'll see Instagram famous people sell it. Like movies will start going after characters that are famous online, whether it be through social media or any of these media platforms, and uh, potentially movie actors, and then they will be able to okay so sell their likeness. I, that to me will be because what, that'll happen first. For yeah, sure. what but, I said is going to be a while out, which I think could be potentially happen. But I just thought of something. Are they going to, in that case, are they going to create regulations that make it illegal or copyright infringement to use the likeness of someone else with, with like deep fakes? Because you know, deep fakes are all over the internet. Sure. You should they be did able this, to sue somebody over your likeness. Yeah, like right? they do this all they okay, they do this to actresses all the time. Well, they'll take their face and put it on a naked body and be right, like right. nude photos or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's really, you know, annoying to people and whatever. Like, does this mean are we gonna create a new because of this? potentially create a new regulatory system where you're not allowed to make a deep fake because sure. that person's likeness sure. is owned by them, I which I like. I, I like, I like that. that too. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm someone's going to make a deep fake about you. I should have, be able to sue the shit out of them if we find out who did it, right? Yeah. Especially if they're they're doing it to defame you or anything like that. So I absolutely think Now, that. at what point do you see them doing this with political leaders? Where like, you're the president and then they just use a, a CGI of you to give the best speech of all time. Who says they're not doing that now? Or to... <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, you guys. Like all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Wow, Biden! He sounds sharp all of a sudden." <laughs> America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot him. Uh, foot, foot, excuse me. Wow, he he's said not a lot stumbling of stuff. on any words. He this said a lot is, of stuff that made yeah. sense, bro. You yeah. hear him? They do, give him? Do you hear them trying to defend him when he was asking for the senator that passed away like Dude. a year ago or whatever? It was a senator, right? Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. How he's, do you need to defend him on anything anymore? He's, oh, he's, he's, just, uh, he's out there. That's dementia. Yeah. He's, he's in there, man. It's, it's, it makes me it's, sad. It's a problem. It is, it is sad. It's, it's elder abuse, dude. At the, hey, at this he's point, getting manipulated. At this point, the dude is our president. I want all the positive things to happen. I mean, he's running our country. We don't I mean, have a choice at this point. So I, can I hate Can we not to get like an that. assessment? Like, you know, like some kind of mental faculties like checked? Like, is, you know is he why? fit for the job? First like, of all, the, 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 the Democrats don't want that. Of because course not. Then that makes them look bad. Yeah. And the Republicans don't want that either because who takes his place? Yeah. Kamala. Right. Who's she's a winner. <laughs> yeah. They don't want her either. Yeah. She's a winner. So they're like, uh uh-uh. uh. And then if Kamala doesn't take it, who's after that? Was it Pelosi? So everybody's like, <laughs> leave him in the chair. It only gets chair. worse from here. It only leave him in the chair. Leave the guy. Ride this out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think we'll you're right. I think, I think it's bipartisan on this. I think both. Bro, both you know what the stra- Republicans are like? Let's keep him in there. You know, you yeah. know what the strategy is to yeah, keep yourself keep him if you're propped the pre- up. If you were the president, one of the strategies to keep yourself uh, like from getting attacked or whatever is to make sure that the VP is so crazy. <laughs> and scary that nobody wants that you nobody wants to kill yeah you. dude you know what I'm saying uh, yeah I suppose make sure your strategy. running mate is way worse than you oh like, they'll never kill me because yeah. <laughs> you know so and so is going to take we're over we're good that's great hey check this out I'm sure you've already heard of CBD and it's all of its uh, potential benefits here's the problem most CBD products on the market are total garbage they're crap they either don't have CBD in them or they have CBD but they don't have other beneficial cannabinoids they actually work better together Well, there's a company we work with called Ned 
They make full-spectrum hemp oil extract. It's high in CBD, but it has all those other beneficial things in the hemp plant, like the other cannabinoids and terpenes that make you feel it. You take Ned and you feel it. 30 to 45 minutes later, you're like, oh, I took something. I feel pretty damn amazing. Not true with other products. Go check this company out if you want to reduce inflammation, get states of euphoria, become more relaxed, improve your sleep, all the things that CBD can help with, plus all those other cannabinoids and terpenes. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump for 15% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Caesar from Florida. Caesar, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Good, Good man. I uh, just wanted to quickly say um, I'm a brand new listener. I've I'm only been listening for like about almost two months now. Oh, wow. Sweet. And yeah, I just want to thank you guys because for like the past two months, I've just been listening. You guys are the only podcast that I'm listening to now. Um, and you guys have fundamentally changed the way I think and the way I view fitness and health. So I just want to thank you guys for that. Awesome. Hell yeah. yeah. Um, so a little bit of background. I'm, uh, I'm 21 years old right now. Um, I'm 5'11", sitting at about 213, 214 pounds. Um, and my fitness journey just started maybe about a year and a half ago. Um, I, I fell into the category of like skinny fat, not like too big, but not like scrawny, you know? Um, prior to that, I never really worked out as much. It was usually like high school PE, physical education, stuff like that. Um, but I was, um, I was normally more like insecure about how I looked and how I felt. So, um, thank God my best friend, shout out Armani. I'll, I'll send, I'll send him this podcast so he can start listening to you guys too. Um, he actually was the one who, uh, who got me into the gym. And I think around that time in my life, I was lacking a consistency of like anything. So the gym became more of a help through mental health for me. Um, and that, you know, that bled into, um, having a better understanding about physical fitness and health. Um, so I started growing a little bit more muscle, losing a little bit fat, but um, the number on the scale wasn't going down. <laughs> but then I, I realized that, um, if I just felt good and my friends around me were telling me, Hey, look, like your shirts are feeling, you are feeling out. Um, you're looking a little bit better. Um, I was feeling good as well. So the number on the scale didn't really matter at that point, you know? Um, so I just kept working out, uh, we fell into the category of like power lifting. So like a uh, bench press, heavy squats, uh, overhead presses and stuff like that. And, uh, I built a lot of strength. I was hitting PRs. Um, and I felt really good. Um, over some time, uh, me and my boy came to a conclusion where we were like, uh, we kind of want to start a cut and me being a newbie, I was like, what's that? You know? Um, so, uh, we were looking up some information and, you know, guys, young guys in our twenties, all we have to look up to is like influencers online which kind of sucks because like they're usually either trying to sell you a product or they're trying to get a pro card themselves. And they're trying to, you know, it's, it's different mentality. Um, other than like us, guys, honestly, we're just trying to look and feel good, you know? Um, so we found this, uh, we found this like super strict cut, which was like, keep in mind, my calories weren't like, I wasn't tracking anything. Um, I didn't know what that, what that was at all. So this introduced me to like, to counting calories, um, hitting macros and stuff like that. So uh, we did this in cut, which was about 1300 to 1500 calories a day. And, um, I was feeling very depleted. Um, I was always super tired. Um, the, the volume in the gym was like going down. I wasn't hitting PRs anymore. Actually the weight going down. And, um, but like fat was shredding off my body, like insanely. Um, I was around 225 to 30 pounds and I went all the way down to like 190. And I found out that I, I saw I had abs, um, muscle definition was coming out more. And, um, my even friends around me were like telling me, bro, like you look good, this and this and that. But I was feeling like shit, you know, <laughs> um, it was really bad. But, um, that's when I realized that body dysmorphia was a real thing. And, um, I would look in the mirror and I would just feel scrawny. Um, 
So we did that cut for like about two months. Um, that was the lowest I got, so around 190. But then I started introducing more calories. I was feeling a little bit better, um, but I was still losing weight, well, which is kind of weird because I wasn't trying to lose weight anymore. I wanted to gain muscle, like build muscle mass. So um, um, after that, um, I did a bulk. I started looking up information. I did a bulk for like about three, three, four months. And um, I didn't know how. I just, basically, what it said was intake more calories and work out harder. Um, so I did that for like about three, four months. I went all the way back up in weight to like around 212, 212, 213. And then I continued doing that. I reached back up to like around 215. And um, I gained a lot of muscle mass. Um, I was hitting new PRs than the ones I did before. Um, I was feeling a lot better and, um, and I get, I got to a size where I felt comfortable with doing another cut. So with my knowledge of cutting before, which kind of created a bad habit with food, um, it was the only cut I ever did before. So I tried to do that cut again and my body was not responding to it at all. I, I started it last month. I did it for like about, I trying to do it for like about two weeks and I was feeling I was feeling bad. It was, uh, again, I was feeling very tired. I wouldn't want to get up to go to work in the morning. Um, I would come home from work and I would just like fall asleep for like two, three hours, wake up and feel like crap at the gym. And, um, but yeah, so like, um, my question to you guys is like, what's the best way to work out? Should I change my workout? Should I change my diet? What would be the best way to do that if I just want to get lean and feel good? Yeah, good question. First off, Caesar, you, you're you're 21 years old, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to commend you. Tremendous awareness, self awareness at your age and how new you are to working out. The things that you're talking about and the way you're talking about how you feel. You mentioned body dysmorphia. Um, that level of awareness through fitness takes people typically a lot longer, and especially men. It takes young men a lot longer to get to the point that you're at now. So you are kicking ass. You're really at a, at a good place with your self-awareness. And I think you're going to get where you want to um, pretty quickly here. There's just a few things that are missing. And one of them is just the right information. Okay. You just need the right information. You're one of those few people where if I give them the right information, I think that's usually enough to get that person to where they want to go. So here's where you went wrong before. Where you want, went wrong before is you cut calories too aggressively. Now, any cut is going to reduce some energy, and any cut you're going to notice a performance drop in the gym. Okay, so that's just normal, right? If you have a lot, if you have more calories, you got more energy. If you have less calories, you have less energy. But your cut sounds way too aggressive—13 to 1500 calories. I don't know where you were at before that. I'm based off what you're saying. It sounds to me like you went down a thousand or more calories based off where you were before. So basically, what you want to do, Caesar, is if you want to bulk or you want to cut, you got to figure out where you're at first before you do that. Okay. So let's say you're eating on average 2,700 calories a day and you're like, Hey, I want to start to drop some body fat. I wouldn't go from 2,700 to 1,500 calories. I'd go from 2,700 to 2,000 calories because it's less aggressive. You're going to get less of those negative side effects. You're more likely to feel motivated, more likely to feel good. And you hit the nail on the head. Like, okay, great. You're losing weight, but you feel like garbage and you're dreading it, and you just don't want to do it anymore. And then one of the things you touched on is that it became less effective the second time around. And this can happen when your cuts are too aggressive and you do them for too long. The body actually starts to become better at storing body fat, and it starts to become better at holding on to it in a calorie deficit. In fact, in extreme cases, you'll see like high-level competitors, bodybuilders, physique competitors, bikini competitors, and they'll talk about burnout and they'll be like, oh my God, my body doesn't respond anymore. I have to do more and more just to get down to the same body fat. So you just went too aggressive. You got to first track where you're at and then from there go slower because uh, you, you want to feel good while you do this. Otherwise, you know, for most people, it's not worth it. Like, okay, great. People are saying you look good. You got abs, but you feel like garbage. Like, I mean, you already came to that conclusion, right? It's, it's just not worth it. Same thing with the bulk. You might have gone too aggressive with the bulk. You know, and, you, and you, you kind of said, you know, basically eat a lot more and work harder. I mean, yeah, but it's way more complex than that. Really, a bulk is increase your calories, maybe 500 above where you were, 
And then your workouts, no matter what, your strength training should always be aimed at building muscle, whether you're trying to cut or trying to build. Now, why is that the case? Because if you're training in a way to build muscle, you're going to minimize muscle loss when you cut. And then when you're training to build muscle, you're going to maximize muscle gain when you're trying to gain. So those are the things that I would have you uh, focus on. And I think if you, you know, based off the awareness that the way that you're, you're expressing yourself, I think knowing that, I think you're going to get there pretty quick. To be even more specific uh, to what Sal's saying, because I 100% agree uh, with all the advice you just gave, I would uh, get off the diet completely uh, and eat when you're hungry. Make good choices. Track for one week. So download your favorite, you know, tracking app, whether that's Fat Secret or My Fitness Pal or whatever else is out there. And and the goal for that week is to eat when you're hungry, but make good choices and then just track what do you what is what do you consume on average? So then you get the total for the entire week divided by seven days. And then we find out that, oh, it looks like right around 2,700 calories is where you feel satisfied. You're not really putting on a bunch of weight. You're not going down the opposite direction. You feel good energy-wise. There, there's homeostasis, okay? There's your, your caloric maintenance. From there, de depending on what you want to do, like Sal said, if your goal is to bulk, add 500 calories to the diet. If your goal is to cut, reduce 500 calories from the diet. And you can do that in two different ways. You can do that either, one, through creating more activity, or by reducing calories, or a little mix of both. Maybe I reduce 250 calories, but then now I go for a hour walk every single day that I didn't do before. That would also create that deficit. And then the last piece that he didn't really touch a lot on that I would add in there, because uh, I don't know if your programming looks the same as what it has for the last year or so. So if you're kind of still following that you know, bench squat debt, which by the way is an incredible place to start. And I think a, a solid was solid for you to do what you did, which is getting strong and, and lifting on the big, the big five. Right. But if it, it, if it looks just like that and it has looked just like that for a long time, you might also benefit from changing up your programming because, and give your body a new stimulus. And so that can look at by manipulating rep ranges, rest periods, exercises, um, I, I think, uh, based off of what I'm hearing from you, I'd love to give you maps aesthetic or performance. Either one of those I think would be a good new novel stimulus from what you sound like you've been training. The combination of a new training program following a diet, diet protocol like that. I think you're going to, you're going to feel great. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Caesar, I think, um, performance would probably be better to start with for now maps performance. So if you're not familiar with that, it's a movement focused, kind of athleticism focused strength training workout. So the goal is still to build muscle, but it's going to train your body in different planes of motion, which is probably different than what you've been doing. So it's going to help develop a more balanced body. And then from there, you can go back to what you were doing before or one of our other programs. Or aesthetic. That's how I definitely, or aesthetic, yeah, yeah, I'd go performance and aesthetic. I mean, that, literally that's how we wrote our programs in that order is to follow a kind of five by five esque type of routine, which it sounds like you're kind of following and then move into performance and then move into aesthetic. So uh, Doug will send you over performance to go that route. Yeah, but I, I definitely want you to continue to listen to your body. And, you know, you're going to get a lot of information out there. I'm glad we're the only people you're listening to because there's a lot of, I mean, God, there's more bullshit out there than there is good information. But yeah, even I actually fell, I actually fell, um, fell uh, into like listening to you guys on YouTube, actually trying to find the information that I'm asking you right now. So. <laughs> okay. Well, good deal. Uh, well, well, I'll tell you what, even our information, Caesar, can sometimes be wrong for you. And what I mean by that is listen to your body. If something doesn't feel right, if your energy's down, if you start to feel pain that's not, you know, normal, you know, workout pain, but like joint pain, you notice your libido crashes. Um, if it feels like it's too much volume, you know, something we recommended or whatever. Listen to your body because um, you know, you're as an individual, there's gonna be a variance between how you respond versus other people. And that right there is going to guide you so well on this journey of fitness that you you just embarked on. You're ahead of the game already, bro. Mm -hmm. You sound for your age already with the questions that you're asking, like Sal said, I think uh I think you're doing great, dude. You're gonna have a great journey. Keep us posted along the way. You have questions, hit us up uh either on social or in the forum or uh reach back out to us, man. Yeah, keep digging into our podcast and everything else. We got you. Yeah, I listen to you guys every single day now. So awesome. you guys have so content out there is probably really hard to get through it all. So you guys are going to be ones I listen to a lot now. Awesome. So thank you. guys. Right thank you, thanks, thanks for calling in, man. I appreciate it, guys. Take care. You got it. 
Yeah. How rare is it to hear a 21 year old who just started working out to, to talk that way? Yeah. You know, 21 year old guy. Yeah. You don't hear that a lot, especially his, his own self-awareness, like going through that and really analyzing, you know, how he was feeling through that whole process. It's like, we just want to get big or we want to get shredded. That's really like the, the main focus oh, typically at that age. Dude, me at 21, I would have been like, I feel like shit, but I'm still doing this. You know, yeah. I would have just not yeah, listened just pushed to anybody. through. You just, know? just until my body just yelled at me. You it, know? It's so wild. How, I mean, it, you're right. His, his awareness of that age is so great. The fact that, but like he was at, you know, big and strong at one point felt like he wasn't big and strong. Got lean got yeah. super shredded and lean felt all scrawny it's a it's a it's really interesting how you you play mind games i mean i i think that everybody has a little bit of this in themselves and and i always think and i think you've said it before in the podcast how like you know what you how many times have you looked back at a picture and said like and go like damn man i looked really good there looking back at the picture yeah. but then also go like have the awareness to go oh shit you know what though I remember now that I think about yeah. it, when I was there, I thought I was this, or I, you know, and it mm -hmm. like it really takes you to get outside of yourself in Dude. that moment and to, to look back and go like, damn, that's wild. Like, it's really hard to be present, yeah. you know, and like really acknowledge, uh, you know, how you're feeling in that moment because yeah, you look back at those pictures like, man, I was awesome back then, and like you what don't was realize, I thinking? Well, it, yeah, it, you're like starving yourself or whatever. And it also highlights well, what the main driver many times is for all of us, you know, and it's, it's, it is that process of getting to a place where you choose exercise, you choose dieting, you choose training because like Sal always says, you love yourself, not because you don't, you know, it's, and when we're, when it's driven by, I don't like the way I look, I don't like the way I feel. I don't. It distorts it, the hell it, out of it everything. It distorts because even when you're doing great, you still don't think so because it came from a, a, a place Dude, that isn't I, good. I literally, I mean, okay, so two things happened. Uh, Jessica saw a picture of years ago, when her and I went on a vacation. She's like, oh my God, look how great, you know, because right now she's pregnant, right? So she's like, well, I can't wait to get fit. And I said, do you remember like literally that morning? Because there was a conversation we had that morning where you were super self-critical. She's like, yeah, I know, I know. Same thing happened to me. I saw a picture of myself at 15. I was at work with my dad. I was wearing a tank top. I mean, 15 was like the height of my insecurity, like the peak of it. And I looked at it, I'm like, bro, I was a jack 15-year-old. I had been working out already for a year, but I was so, so self-critical. I thought I was like the skinniest, weakest yeah. looking kid in the world. So really can mess with you. And then, okay, now, now to go and kind of touch on what, what we said with Caesar, being too aggressive with your calorie changes is going to make it much more challenging. Bottom mm -hmm. line, can you get there faster with a more aggressive cut or a more aggressive bulk? Theoretically, you can do that. I mean, there's studies that'll show, yeah, you know, if you cut way more calories, you lose more body. But w the way it affects your behaviors and the way it affects how you feel, I always completely disagree because how you feel is going to dictate your behaviors. And if you feel like shit, okay, fine, you lost another five pounds of body fat. Let's see, we're going to be out in five months or six months. Right. You're going to rebound in the opposite direction. Well, also, you know, one of the things that played into his favor is that, you know, at that, there's a little bit of, I don't know, what's a, a term, a good term for this, like a, a metabolic resiliency at that age. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you can get away with doing some pretty extreme diets and stuff when you're in your teens and 20s. You've, if you've done that, you know, 10, 15, 20 times over the course of a decade or two yeah, decades. Or you're in your back. 40s and your sleep isn't great. Your yeah, hormones on what yeah. they used to be. So part half of the the great results that he got from the massive cut was just because his body is that resilient yeah. and, and he's and he's got a lot of things working in his favor. You can and it's so great that, like you said, he had the awareness to know this already because it, it you know, it could you could fall into that trap of that's how you do it. You know, oh, this is how the way it's time to diet. I just starve myself for the next yep. month mm -hmm. and I, it'll get me to where I want to be. And to, to be aware enough to catch that this early, like he's, he's really going to save himself from a lot of uh, headaches in the future. Totally. Our next caller is Brian from California. Brian, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey guys, really appreciate you having me on. Um, and first and foremost, I want to say, I, I respect a ton that you guys are uh, able to build a business around getting people like truly healthy. Um, I, I work in the healthcare industry and unfortunately a lot of times the people that I talk to aren't that healthy. So it's really cool that you guys are able to, to do that. So awesome. hopefully business nice. is booming. Thank Bri you, Brian. Brian, real quick, I'm going to interrupt you because I love what you said. And, and that's our goal. We want to prove that you can build a business in the fitness space, doing it the right way. That's really our goal. Anyway, continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, cool. It's Cause it's kind of rare, right? Like nowadays I feel like sick people are where the money's at. That's and right. mm -hmm. so it would be it would be nice if everybody started listening to Mind Pump and then you put me out of a job. I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Come work for us. Well, yeah. we'd have to hire you exactly. at that point. So there we go. Yeah, perfect. Sign me up. Well, uh, so last month, um, I purchased the Skinny Guy Bundle. 
Um, and it's been uh, super cool. I'm in anabolic uh, phase two right now. First and foremost, hopefully it's okay. Um, I split it up like upper lower just because I enjoy lifting six days a week. Um, I know for most people, the full body works better because they only have to go three days a week. But I mean, is that kind of similar results anyway? Yeah, it's the same. Yep. You're fine. Okay, cool. Um, so my question was, um, there are some novel exercises in there, like stuff that I don't normally do. One of them being shrugs. Um, and so it's been, it's been really fun doing, you know, the shrugs that I don't always do. Uh, but my question was, I know that it, it takes a long time to build muscle, but like how long realistically, if I'm doing it correctly, should I expect to actually see results and hopefully get traps like Adam, as long as it doesn't make me moody. Wow. <laughs> wow. That was like well, a shit sandwich right yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't have it all, dude. Yeah, it yeah. takes it takes it takes approximately 23.7 days to, yeah. No, there's no number. Okay. It's hard because uh there's such an individual individual variance on how quickly you can build muscle. Then there's the context of your life and what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I barely like, I barely do them and Sal does them all the time and look how much better mine look. I mean, that's It's really crazy. There's, there's going to be like a, a genetic side. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> God damn it. I work out twice as much as he does. No, you know, it's and there's also, you know, the other thing too to keep in mind, there's not just genetic variance on how fast you can build muscle. And so we're a limit. We're, by the way, I'm taking out all the context of everything else you do, right? We're just talking genetics. But then there's a genetic difference between your own muscles. Like, uh, you know, you may have body parts that respond really well and other body parts where you're like, okay, why doesn't this seem like it even exists? Like it doesn't mm -hmm. even respond at all. So I can't answer that for you. Um, and I can't even give you a straight answer as to whether or not shrugs are the best exercise for your traps. I know people where, you know, high poles mm -hmm. just blow up their traps or, tra or farmer walks way more than shrugs. So I, I can't answer that question, but I can say that if you consistently get stronger, consistently feel more and more connected to an exercise, you're moving in the right direction. I can tell you uh, one of the probably challenges that you have, you actually look like you're, or not look, but you, by, based off of your numbers, are probably built similar to myself, 6'3", 205, having to eat 4,000 calories just for maintenance. I imagine one of the challenges that you have is actually probably bulking and building muscle because it's just hard to eat that many. You have, are you super active at work? Is that what, what causes this? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around all the time. I mean, I don't, I don't do like a ton of extra stuff. I mean, I play golf mostly on the weekends. I'll walk and carry my bag. But other than that, like primar primarily, I just like to get in and lift and then just a lot of walking. Yeah. Um, so there's not, there's not a ton of extra stuff just cause I mean, by the way, though, golfing guys, so. burns a fuck ton of calories. You, a lot of people, just yeah. walking. <laughs> yeah, especially if you, if you, I mean, you even, your even if you do, around, even yeah. if you do the cart, I mean, you still, I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, four hour day plus of, of a sport. And most of that is walking around. I mean, this, the swinging sure makes a little bit more calorie burn, but I mean, you, I burn a ton of calories when I golf. So, I mean, it's, uh. Don't downplay that. I mean, there's a lot. And so I think a guy who has a 4,000 calorie maintenance and then you add in a golf day, I bet you burn like 6,000 calories on that day. That's hard to be in a surplus. So do you tend to struggle with that where you you have a hard time gaining weight? Yeah, I mean, that's that's been primarily the goal is to always start. I mean, it's it's really slow. Like I've definitely gained uh, weight, like uh, especially since listening to you guys and like kind of prioritizing my protein and stuff. Um, it's been very, very slow, but I have noticed like I'm, I'm building, I'm getting stronger. Um, it just takes me a long time. Yeah. How long have you been working out? I mean, I've been working out most of my life, uh, but okay. I don't know if you guys recall, I actually called in one time before and I hey, told you guys a story. Like I primarily lifted in college, but then I got really into like Spartan racing and stuff, okay. lost a, like a ton of weight. And then during covid like around 2020 I, I started listening to you guys and was doing mostly like strength training yeah. and then it's been mm -hmm. over the last couple of years like i've put on a solid like 15 to 20 pounds muscle oh, mass. oh wow so when you put on muscle like what that look like on the rest of your uh muscles in, in your body parts like what what did that look like like as far as like proportions like, or well you're asking about like how long it, it takes you to develop you know your your traps like what did that look like in terms of gaining muscle elsewhere um, I mean, just, just very slow and gradual. I think, I think my main, like the main question I was getting at was because I never do anything really on the traps. Mm -hmm. Like, would I expect to see quicker growth because it's so novel? Oh, Pot yeah. Potentially, yeah. potentially, I mean, potentially, yes. But, but Sal's, Sal's way of answering it is still true, right? Like there's certain things, there's, there's certain body parts and you probably already know this about yourself that 
you you touch the weights and you see like a response right away and there's other body parts yeah. that you feel like you hammer well, the shit out of it that's what i'm it. getting at it's like you know you're gonna notice that like like for me as a chest or, or you know legs specifically anywhere in my legs like will just grow and that's just one of those things like certain muscle groups just respond quite more substantially what body part do you have that doesn't grow just <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, feel well, like, I don't want to talk about. Yeah, it. I feel like we're talking to hard gainers. So, you need to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So whenever, whenever go, uh, go get a sandwich, guy. Whenever, <laughs> Listen, yeah, whenever Adam and weight. Sal are talking about the calves, I'm always like, man, I, I understand the struggle. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I tell you what, Brian. Um, muscle building is slow. There's there's very very few people on earth. Where it's a fast process. I think I've met one or two people in my entire life. Well, we didn't even ask you how old you were, too. How old are you, Brian? I'm 32. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. It, it's a slow process for everybody. I mean, look, a, a man, typical man, which most of us, when I say typical, it's like 95% of us are going to fall in this category. 4.5% of us are going to be a little bit better. 0.5% of us are going to be better than that. And then of that 0.5, there's like 1% of that where you just build muscle and it's just crazy. It's crazy fast. So it's, so for the vast majority of us, the average man can gain in a year with really dedicated, proper training and diet. And I'm talking about lean body mass, not body fat, just pure lean body mass. Maybe 12 pounds of lean body mass in a year, maybe 15 pounds at the most for the average female, six, eight pounds, maybe 10 if she's super consistent with it. And then after that, it really slows the hell down. It's like, then you're gaining like three, four, five pounds a year or less. Like if I gain two pounds of lean body mass at 43 years old per year now, like I'm, I'm ecstatic, but it's not happening. I just want to let you know, I'm not gaining any muscle anymore at this point. So it is a slow process. And, um, and so really, it's really a game of, can you push your body to be more anabolic than catabolic? Cause you're always either, right. You're either losing or gaining, and the goal is to be a little bit more gaining than a little bit more losing. Um, and at some point, you're just going to maintain it. At some point, you're just going to fight being catabolic. That's that's once you pass a certain age, maybe in your 60s or whatever. So it's a slow process. That's about it. Really, the best metrics are how you feel, strength. And then even after that, it's going to be connection. Do I feel the muscles working? Do I feel connected? Do I... Do I feel really good? That that then becomes the best metric one, long term. One of the things to help uh, do what Sal's saying as far as being anabolic more than your catabolic is being aware of uh, your activity and movement. Like that's why I brought up the golf thing. Like I don't I don't know if you do a good job of making sure on those days like you're you're, you're staying fuel. More. Yeah, eat more. You know, make sure that you. Uh, Can you bring food on the golf course? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, shit, bring a cooler with sandwiches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have a golf cart. Goes <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, though. I mean, uh, and this is, by the way, this is terrible advice, but I'm just going to tell you something I used to do in my 20s that kind of got me over this hurdle of not being able to put weight on because I played a lot of basketball was I'd have to, I had to pound like a sugar drink, like a 500 calorie drink of just calories and sugar before I played. And then again, refuel with something right afterwards just to account for all the calories I was burning uh, playing basketball and then on top of my regular day. So, you know, and that really helped me get through this, that phase of not being able to eat enough. So pay attention to, you know, your activity and try and make sure that you're increasing your calories on these days when you're, you're probably burning a lot. Here, I'll make it even easier. Brian, are you dairy intolerant? Can you have milk? Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I do like a uh, way I slid protein and cheese and stuff, uh, like straight milk isn't always the best, but, okay. um, well, I'll forget that. But I, I mean, I can, I, I can, if I mean, milk, why are you saying like drink, drink well, some milk? Bro, listen, if you can have milk, I want to say this right now on the podcast, it is nature's best bulking, you know, muscle building, easy beverage. There's nothing better. There isn't a protein shake that's better than milk. Now the problem is a lot of people can't tolerate milk, especially in large quantities. But if you added a glass of milk to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you added like 400 calories and you added good quality protein, you added some sugar and the fats aren't bad either. So uh, just, I mean, literally you could just drink milk. Adam said drink a, you know, a, a high calorie. If you added milk to every meal, you're totally, you're, that's it. You're done. You don't got to do much right. more. That's a and, Midwestern thing. Bro, it's, I see that a lot. Yeah. Like people drink milk like, like yeah. every meal. Well, yeah. That's it right My there. I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to re revisit that because uh, I tried, after listening to uh, Carnivore MD, I tried the raw milk and that was kind of gnarly. So maybe I'll just do regular Right yeah, but if you can't tolerate milk and a lot of people can't, then, you know, make it a protein shake and you can throw, 
you know, maybe some fruit in there or something like that, and that'll be totally fine. I mean, the key is to make sure you're, you're just getting you're getting calories before and after you do any activities like that that just burn a ton. Yeah. For, and and for a guy that struggles like that, remember for our audience that's listening to this isn't like general advice that we tell everybody to do. It's like this is somebody who is struggling to put weight on, and so the advice starts to change a little bit. Yep. Like you yep. you have to do different strategies than and then the the average yeah. person. To get but you're on, you're on track, dude. If you gained that muscle mass that you said you did earlier, and you're you're feeling stronger, you're on track, bro. It just takes time. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Hey, thank you guys so much. You Thanks, got it, Brian. man. Thanks All for right. calling Appreciate in, Brian. Absolutely. You know, Have a good day. You too. You know what, Adam? I'm going to touch on what you just said because I 100% guarantee you triggered a bunch of wellness <laughs> I know. freaks. I so know. I know. here's the deal, okay? And this is a fact. Now, I'm not going to say that this is everything because it's more complex than what I'm about to say, but this is a fact. 95 to 98% of the detriments that comes from things like sugar, saturated fats, ultra processed foods even, is when your calories are higher than you're burning. So if you drink a 500 calorie sugar drink and that puts you at such high calories that you're like a thousand calories over and you have to lose fat because you're overweight, you're going to have lots of health uh, detriment. If your problem is like with Brian, where you can't get enough calories to gain weight and that 500 calories of the sugar drink makes up the difference, he's probably not going to notice any health detriments. Now, that doesn't mean he may not notice effects on his behaviors. Cause what may happen is it may make him feel lethargic. It may make him feel crappy or irritable, in which case then it's not a good idea, but based off of just metrics and blood lipids and just overall health, like taking behavior out, which again, behavior can definitely be affected. Then it doesn't make that huge of a difference. So when I'm talking to a hard gainer and I'm like, yeah, you know what? Uh, make a shake with ice cream in it and, you know, throw in some peanut butter and some protein powder and whatever. And I'm like, and you know, if it doesn't make you feel crappy, and that helps you hit your calorie targets, you're fine. I'm right. That's that, that's just the bottom line. Yeah, I know people are going to get trouble. Oh, I knew they would too. Mm-hmm. I know they will too. And the, and the truth is that it's you're, I'm not saying what I think the best thing for your body health-wise. It's like I'm trying to help a, a something that I know you're having challenge. I mean, you're 30-something years old. You're having a hard time still putting weight out. I've been there. Like I've been there before, training like crazy, trying to, trying to eat all about. And it's just hard to get four or 5,000 calories without using that. I mean, do I think absolutely he should have chicken breast and white rice instead? Would that be a better choice? Yeah, okay. Yeah, try sure. doing 5,000 calories. Yeah, that. try doing that uh, before you go golf. You know, every, it's just not, it's not reason, it's not realistic for most people. And so- It could know. also be unhealthy in the other way, Adam, because imagine if you tried to go to 4,000 calories and do it with like what would be considered super healthy food. And, the, and as a result of that, you're there literally force feeding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right, it's also Grinding psychologically your way through it the entire way. There's a psychological unhealthiness, I right? That. I did that. What if you could make up the difference? What if you could eat four thousand, three? Let's say you could eat three thousand calories of these really healthy foods. That extra thousand calories, you're like, if I do it with chicken breasts and, vo- and vegetables and whatever, I'm going to force feed myself, or I could eat this hyper palatable food that actually will make me want to eat it. Well, yeah, there's a there's a there's a there's a you know way off, and one of them is like, well, I'm not going to sit here force feeding myself for an hour. So I think that that's a better option. So it, my point is it's way more complex than the way me, people make it sound. And people in our space often do the whole black and white thing, which mm-hmm. it's never black and white. Our next caller is Alex from California. Alex, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Thanks for uh, having me on. Appreciate it a lot. Um, it. So I guess pretty quick backstory. Um, I started wrestling when I was about four years old and continued on until about 17. Um but never stopped. I continue to help coach and still wrestle to this day. Um, I started working out at about 13, 14 years old. Uh, I now work in law enforcement. I work night shift and about three to four, 16 hour shifts uh, a week. And I started noticing a really big downfall in uh, my mood, my sleep, uh, appetite, workouts and all that. So I went to go get tested. Um, my testosterone was a lot lower than I expected. It was about 307 and they put me on TRT. Um, so I do feel a lot better being on it. It's been about six weeks, seven weeks, give or take. Um, so my question is pretty much how can I produce my testosterone naturally to eventually get off of this? Oh. Cause I don't want to forever. Yeah, good question. All right, mm-hmm. so a couple of things I want to touch on. Uh, first, I want a little disclosure. I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to speak out of uh, personal experience, what I know, and then I'll, I'll recommend you to, to a doctor that I think is probably yeah. Are you not in our Are you not in our private forum? 
or our forum for testosterone? Uh, no, I'm not. MP hormones. I didn't. Yeah. Have that. Well, shame on you. Alex. Yeah, it's Alex. At the, but, but when we're done, I'll, I'll, I'm going to point you in the right direction. Okay. But a couple things I want to I want to mention, just to paint the context. So of all the sports you can compete in and train in, um, especially as a kid and up through high school, the hardest working, I mean, just physically hardest working athletes among the, the top are wrestlers. Wrestlers, polo is another, water polo is another one. Like, you know this because you wrestled. They beat the crap out of you. And then on top of it, especially if you if you uh, wrestle in a weight class, like what weight class did you wrestle in? Uh, high school, I was one... 15, but off season, I was about 135, there it 140. Is. There it is right there. So unless you're like heavyweight, super heavyweight, where there's no weight limit, when you yeah. wrestle, they beat the shit out of you. And then on top of it, unlike football, where for the most part, they're like, just go ahead and get bigger, especially when you're in high school. You're, you, they're like, you're going to have to drop 20 or 30 pounds every season just to make your, your, your weight class. So it's, yeah. it's one of the most, and by the way, this is why wrestlers are such hardworking people. If you've ever, I mean, if you watch MMA, you notice the wrestlers and they're going to outgrind anybody. They have another gear because their whole lives, they, they just know how to deal with just feeling like shit. It's because they beat the crap out of you and you got to make weight and you got to diet and you got to do all this crazy shit and use a saw and all that stuff. So, which I hope you didn't do in high school, but I knew a lot of high school students where the coaches would actually make the gym a sauna mm -hmm. to make, help yeah. them make weight. So I'm sure that happened to you too. So it's Happens insane. And what this will do is this will beat the shit out of your, your hormone levels. This will hammer your testosterone levels. Then you combine that with working a night shift, mm -hmm. and there's a direct effect with your circadian rhythm and testosterone. So my guess is because you trained since you were four as a wrestler, you have a very distorted view or perception of appropriate levels of training. For you, appropriate training is probably overtraining. So you're probably working out too much and too hard. And and it's I yeah, I don't blame you. You Not just get enough recovery. You, yeah, you just you were raised this way, man. And so you really don't have a good gauge. So what I'm gonna tell you right now is uh, I'm gonna I'll send you a workout plan and just follow the workout plan and do nothing else. Do no other workout plan, do nothing else extra on your own because your gauge of intensity and volume is all messed up. I'm gonna tell you that right now, especially since you've been wrestling at four and having to make weight classes. I could tell you that right now with almost all certainty. Now with the hormone, the testosterone replacement therapy, I'm surprised that they put a 26-year-old on testosterone before trying to get your testosterone levels to raise with something like HCG and clomiphene, which are medications designed to get your natural levels to come up. So okay. it, typically what you do first before you do TRT at that age. At your age, yeah, because because when you're under the age of 30 or 35, usually a hormone specialist can say, you know what, let's try this first and see what's happening. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to point you to mphormones.com. And what you can do, Alex, is you can go on there and get an evaluation. So you can request okay. a 30-minute or 60-minute evaluation, bring your labs, bring your whole thing, and then the doctors there, which we've already vetted, are going to go through your protocol and they'll tell you based off what you're saying, hey, we think you should do this or maybe you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I think what they're going to recommend is that you try to go on something else to see what you can do naturally with your testosterone levels. That's what I think they're going to probably do. But again, I'm not a doctor, so <clears throat> I can't put words in their mouth. And even if they don't, they might they might say, you know, let's stay here with the TRT until we can balance everything kind of out and you feel actually good, and then we can start talking about how we would pull you off. Yeah. So that might be a possibility. Now, the other thing I'm going to say with your night shift is here's what you're going to have to do. Um, and if you're not already doing this, try doing this. Your bedroom at home, you're going to need to black out completely because you're going to sleep during the day. So you're going to need to black out your bedroom 100%. And then about an hour before the shift is over, I want you to wear blue light blocking glasses. So, um, and because of your job, you need to stay sharp. I would use Felix gray glasses because they don't change the color of everything because normal blue light blocking glasses will make everything orange or red. So you want to wear blue. Felix Ray has this patented way of blocking blue light without changing everything, the color of everything. So put those on an hour before your shift is over. And what that'll do is it'll tell your brain, hey, the sun is going down. It's kind of time to get ready to go to sleep. Then when you're off, keep those glasses on, go in your bedroom that's blacked out, and then try to go to sleep. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to trick your body into thinking okay. it's it's you know that it's nighttime when it's daytime. And then when you start your shift, when you start your shift, you can use red light therapy after you wake up, 
or you can get and or use these kind of full spectrum light bulbs. Because what you want to do is you want to expose your body to light to trick it. Basically, you want to trick your body into thinking it's daytime when it's night and nighttime when it's day. That's your best bet. It's not perfect, but it's better than what's what you're doing right yeah, now. Yeah, all these interventions make perfect sense in this situation because, I mean, how long do you anticipate being on the night shift? Is this going to be like a few years? Is this something that uh, you know, you're just going to do for this year? It's, uh, it's been about three years now and then probably another three to four. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough, I mean, it's a tough place. Like you said, it's it, any intervention at this point is going to have to be accounted for just because it's so, um, it's so important with, with circadian rhythms to, you know, be able to try and get adequate recovery and sleep. Uh, you know, that's, that's your utmost importance. You're, yeah. You're going to have to hack. This is where biohacking becomes valuable because, um, you're literally going to have to trick your body. That's what you're trying to do. So uh, two hours before your shift is over, don't eat any food. One hour before, wear blue light blocking glasses. When you wake up, expose yourself to red light, uh, red light therapy, or use um, these kind of full spectrum, what are called light bulbs that simulate, you know, like, like sunlight, if you will. It's not a sun lamp. You're not going to tan, but it gives you this kind of broader spectrum and make it bright. Wait about 45 minutes to an hour before having caffeine um, and then go ahead and eat food. But so your goal is to really trick your body as much as possible because working the night shift and having your body be up when it's not, when it doesn't want to be in a, in a sleep when it doesn't want to be, it's got some serious long-term yeah, health effects. some health effects. Yeah, so mean, my wife was on this for, for at least five years and it was pretty detrimental. So yeah. we had to do everything and anything we could uh, to try and get her to get good sleep. So, Alex, yeah. how, many, how many days a week are you training? Uh, right now, only three on my assigned three days off. Okay. I'm going to send you MAPS Anabolic, Alex. I want you to follow the two-day-a-week plan on it, and that's it. I don't want you to do any more. So just okay. do the two. There's a, there's a there's an option for two or three days. Follow the two days on it. You could do trigger sessions on your off days, which are just like five, you know, five to ten minutes. But I don't want you to do any more than that. And I want you to be very careful with the intensity. I want you to train at a moderate high intensity, not at a high intensity. So go easier than you think. Uh, because like I said, you have that gear that's kind of now a part of who you are. And I'm pretty sure I was hitting the nail on the head, right? With with how you trained as a wrestler and how you probably push yourself too hard. Yeah, I mean, I know I realized it, but that's just the way I was, like you said, the way I was raised and trained. So it's kind of hard to shut it off. Yeah, so just like literally follow the programming and just don't don't listen to what you think is, is, is hard enough. Well, yeah, less is probably more. Right? Yeah, less is going to be more. And do that for a little while. I think you'll feel better. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You got it, man. Yeah. And thanks for your service. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. No problem. You guys ever work with somebody who's wrestled since they were kids? Oh, yeah. yeah. That is it's, so brutal. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's a tough one to unpack. <clears throat> I mean, I, I really think it's all athletes, but wrestlers are up there at the top as far as their their ability to endure, right? Yeah. Like, and they got to make weight classes. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, they, oh. they they put them they push them through a one of the most disciplined athletes. Yeah, as far sure. as the the levels of exhaustion and the the amount of uh, caloric, uh, you know, deficits and yeah, no. So you ever see wrestlers walking around in high school spitting yeah. into cups, yeah, yeah. trying mm -hmm. to get rid of water? Oh yeah, and wearing those suits that just you know they it's have to sweat to make great cuts. Dude, yeah, so it's, I mean, you train your whole, <clears throat> and you know what, If it's, he was probably successful, right? He's, he did it most of his life, and now he's a coach, so I'm assuming he was pretty good at it. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of success uh, with that. That's, uh, I think, it, that's what makes it even worse, right? It's one thing if you, like, went through a phase, oh, I played sports for in high school for a little bit, we trained this yeah, way. It's like four? Yeah, but since I was a kid, I was really good. It's I'm a, a part of his now. identity. Oh, yeah, 100% is a part of his identity, and so... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I had nothing really to add to yours as far as the advice. Cause that is the, you know, he needs to pull. It's one of the sports. Back. It's one of the only sports I can think of. Well, there's a couple that, that says work until you throw up and then also watch your food intake and don't eat too much. You know, <laughs> like, other sports don't necessarily, you know necessarily do that. You, uh, yeah. you said something I want to add to though, uh, about the biohacking and th this is really an, an interesting, uh, it was an interesting point that you made. So, uh, rarely ever would I, you know, talk about the red light and the Felix Grays mm -hmm. and, and, and like doing all those little things. Yeah. Doing all these little kind of hack. We'd always be like, okay, let's, let's assess your programming. Let's talk about your die first. But this is an exception to that rule because mm -hmm. he, he's working the night shift. Like, what are you going to do? It's, yeah. Honestly. Yeah. There's it. You're basically creating an artificial environment for yourself because you're not, you know, going to sleep when, when everybody else is. So it's like, you have to like create this little bubble for yourself to be able to get adequate recovery. I mean, it's just an example of what there's always an exception to the rule. This is an exception where this person my advice starts to change it becomes more about 
just getting him to feel better, uh, minimizing the amount of stress that his body's feeling right now, getting him as much adequate rest. And that's less, uh, you normally wouldn't do that. You normally wouldn't say that to a person who's, yep. who's struggling with their training. We would go so many different directions. But in this case, uh, that makes a lot totally. of sense. Totally. And I really do hope he goes to mphormones.com because, again, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, we'll, we'll help him out. But I, I do find it a little strange that the first place that they went with a 26 year old with testosterone that was, you know, low. But not so low that it's like, oh my God, right? But so still low. I'm gonna make a, they went straight I'm gonna on make TRT. a prediction right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I said a long time ago on the podcast that I think that the uh hormone replacement therapy is going to be the next uh yeah, I know going. cannabis. And the next thing that we're gonna see is a lot of this now because they have opened it, um, and it's it's there's kind of this gray area they're operating in, very similar to the cannabis industry. Uh, and just like what I saw there is this is where, you know, you get so yeah. many people in there. You're going to see a lot of shady, but it's going to be hard to find the really, really good companies right. uh, that are doing this because everybody's going to be doing it. And people are going to attach themselves to what a good company is based off of, you know, some popular influencer or a bunch of people. Oh, I tried them. They're great. Or, oh, they hook you up or they mm -hmm. give you more than everybody else does. Like, so you're going to see a lot of that competitiveness to get to to get customers, yep. which is going to be unfortunate because I bet we're going to see more and more questions. There's like a this. big difference between yeah. a 26 year old with low testosterone and a 46 year old low testosterone oh, usually difference. usually in how you how you treat that again i'm not a doctor but um, especially if he's saying right. that his goal was to not that's what i thought was kind of crazy yeah i mean general uh, your your typical gp would like be hesitant to even give it to yeah. someone yeah. like this and then if he's also saying like hey how do i get off this my goal is not to be on it forever i just that's it really weird to me it smells like okay some you know, company that's that like just here, pay this monthly fee. Yeah. It's cheap. Here's yeah. your testosterone. Yes. Type of deal. Yes. Our next caller is Chris from Oregon. Chris, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, thanks again for being here and uh, answering this question for me. So my question is really more about performance rather than health and, um, you know, basic, uh, long-term sustainability. So I've been lifting for about 50 or about 12 to, to 15 years, uh, pretty consistently. I'm 35 years old right now and I'm 5'11", 184 pounds. So over uh, about six years ago, I got into marathon running and I've been trying to balance marathon running with weightlifting and I've kind of hit a plateau with the marathons and you know, it's a, a pretty good marathon that I can run, but to really kind of break through that next level, I think I need to be a little bit lighter. And I've been DEXA scanned about three times in the past year and a half. I always come in at about 11% body fat. And I find that if I try to get much below that, uh, maybe into the the very high nines or, or low tens, I really start struggling with my training. And basically, I, I don't know how to now get to maybe 175 pounds so I can race faster without feeling either like total garbage and therefore not being able to, to train for the marathons or pairing off some muscle. So I have MAPS an Anabolic and I have MAP MAPS Performance, both fantastic programs. I love MAPS Performance. It works so well for me. It, it, I, I love that type of workout. But running it even at those uh, higher rep ranges that, um, you know, phase, I think two and three both have pretty high rep ranges. I, I'm not going to lose any muscle at, at, you know, at a minimum. So do you have any suggestions on how I might go about this with the MAPS program or am I looking at this all wrong? Yeah, this is actually easy. Um, by the way, MAPS is too effective. So if you follow any MAPS program. No, <laughs> it's got so, too big, man. No, no, oh, here's man. the deal. I can tell you right now what too your, much muscle. I can tell you what your problem was before. So I've trained a couple of marathon athletes and we had to do this. And your the, the reason why you did this wrong before is you try to do it with, with through diet. Am I right? You try to get leaner, dropping weight by just oh, getting yeah. It. yeah. That's a problem because you need the calories yeah. Yeah. for fuel. And you, and and now here's what you do. Just don't think of the losing muscle process is a burning muscle off process. Think of it as an adaptation process. It's literally this easy. This is all you got to do. Lift weights less and run more. Okay. And your body will adapt in a way that makes you better at running. So rather than doing two days a week or three days a week of strength training, mm -hmm. keep it one day a week. Keep it very basic. You're training for a marathon, so you're going to be running a lot anyway. And it's going to help maintain some of your strength and you're going to lose some muscle. And that's about that. So what's going to happen is you just get better at running. Mm -hmm which means you're going to probably pare some muscle down. So I wouldn't lift more than once a week at the most, maybe 45 minutes at most. Keep the intensity moderate at high, at the highest level, and just do your running. And you'll find that you'll start losing muscle. And don't worry about the diet. Fuel your body 
with the appropriate level of calories. Who is who's our buddy? Who's a <clears throat> fan of the show? We had him on a long time Zach, ago. Zach, thank you, Zach yeah, Bitter. Bitter. Yeah, yeah. You you follow Zach Bitter? You know who that is? He's a great one. Oh, to of follow. course. Yeah, Zach's great. Yeah. Did you know we interviewed him a long time ago? No, I didn't. I got to go find that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go back at what long time? Like five. Fat maybe, adapted maybe athlete. Than that, man. Yeah, yeah. He's. Uh, I, I really like uh, what he does leading up to the race and what he does nutritionally. I thought was really interesting. Uh, and counter to what I would have thought back then. Mm -hmm. So uh, great, great interview that we did with him, and, and may apply to some of the things that you're doing. What's your time, Chris? What are you, what are you clocking in at? Right now, I'm at two thirty three at one eighty five pounds, and I'm trying to get below two thirty. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. Is, now, what is it to qualify for Boston? Is it do you have to get below two thirty? Is that why that's your number? No, no. Um, Boston for me at my age is three oh five. So oh, you're there. That. Yeah, so I'm there. I at this point it's just I want to see how good I can do. Yeah, that's listen, that's purely it. Chris, it's literally as easy. Just keep feeding yourself and run more and lift less. Mm -hmm. And your body's going to change and adapt. And by the way, here's what may happen. This is going to fuck with you a little bit. Your body fat percentage is probably going to go up because yeah. you're going to lose some muscle and the scale may not go down as much as you think uh because of the little bit of a transfer, but you'll get better at running. So I wouldn't even worry so don't worry too much about the weight or anything like that. Just measure your performance. You'll probably you'll lose muscle through doing that, and you'll lose some weight. Your body fat percentage may go up. Don't get hung up on that, though, okay? Because some marathon runners – actually, I would say this. There's quite a few marathon runners that I trained who, por who performed better at 15% body fat than they did at 10% body fat. Oh, I would think that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I would, I would, I mean, that it's, it's stored fuel that yeah. you can tap into later on. So it's not, they just felt better because they, they were able to fuel themselves. You know, yeah. there's, there's of course people that, well, do. you got to think that the lower and lower we get body fat percentage, the more and more you're, we're sending a signal to our, our body to you know, freak out a little bit yeah. and not operate correctly. You get, you get really, really low like that. And then you're also pushing it. I, I just think that you're going to operate better in that 10 to 15% range than you would yeah. ever at like a six or seven for a, totally. a, a marathon runner. Do you not feel like as explosive as you're running? Like, is that something, a focus of yours that you've, you've noticed? No, I feel pretty, ex pretty great when I'm running. I mean, the okay. training's really, really solid. It's just, uh, you know, people that are my, yeah, the people that are my height that are trying to run, you know, sub two thirties, they're usually about 140 to 145 pounds at most. Mm. So mm -hmm. 40 extra pounds carrying I around see. for 26 miles. It's, Typically not, yeah. um, I mean, not the same guy, you know? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Sal hit it on the head, though. Yeah. This, it's actually not that hard. It's, you know what's the greatest challenge? Mentally. 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, because you probably like, you're probably one of the more buff looking runners out there. And that probably yeah, feels- 184, five, Yeah, 184, 10% body fat. <laughs> you probably look really, really damn good. And so you're, and you're asking a performance question. And so the, the answer is, you know, care less about, you know, kind of how you look and actually just- lift a little less and keep running the way you are or more yeah. and your body will actually you adapt. Could, you could pick one of the workouts for mass performance, one of the foundation workouts and just do that once mm -hmm. a week. Once um, a week. And that's, and that's pretty, and the mobility you can always do, of course, because that's going to be good for you. I'm going to make a prediction, Chris. I'm going to predict that you're going to get there and then you're going to not like it and you're going to want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> My wife already hates the idea. So yeah, <laughs> probably so. Yeah, But I get it. I get wanting to attain uh, goals and well, it's yeah, be a huge you, accomplishment. I mean, you're kicking ass. So I mean, I would, I'd be here. I'd be wanting to kind of see what I yeah, could do too. Who doesn't want to win? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so I get it. It's a season phase. Yeah, but that's yeah. it. Just lift, lift way less and, and, and keep running the way you are and it'll happen. Hey, circle back though. I'd like to hear how, how it goes for you. All right, cool, man. Hey, thanks again for all you do. I really appreciate you. You got thanks, it. All right. You know, you know, the first time I had a client that where this became a thing, I did it totally wrong, right? So I got this client, marathon runner. That was their main focus. Tried to have him like do more lifting. Well, I was so. trying to get him shredded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, muscle is oh, good. Yeah. Let's just get you lean. And all he's muscle, like, yeah. and he was, he was getting leaner. And he's like, but my times are, are worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, and then I'm like, maybe he just needs to be smaller and maybe have a higher body fat. So I said, Hey, listen, man, I'm going to train you mm -hmm. once a week for 30 to 45 minutes. We're going to stop this lifting. You're going to just run and you're probably going to lose strength. You're probably whatever. And then let's see what happens. And lo and behold, he got way better at running. And then of course it's one of those like face palm moments. Like, oh, of course, yeah. you know, well, and then too, I only asked, like, and I know he's doing strength training, so that makes sense that he would feel like he's strong and like explosive as he's running, because that was an issue with some some marathon runners yeah. I've trained before was they just they didn't have that kind of snap, you know, to be able to have kind of breakaway speed when they needed it. Uh, but it sounds like he has that, so now it's really just about you know like managing his energy appropriately. Yeah. 
Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. They're all free and they can help you with most health and fitness goals. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is also on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can only find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. This one's really important and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.